there. It's not it's of having a big family. Okay. I would like to call the April 15th meeting of the planning board to order. The board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. Number one, approval of the minutes from March 18th, 2013. 2014 Planning Board meeting in the Hills Mitchell Highlands subdivision amendment, followed by the Jordan subdivision amendment. <coughs> Number four will be the middle school boiler room site plan amendment. Number five, the Tamarose landscaping and summer oven site plan amendment. Number six, the well, a 44 seat restaurant site plan. Then the Harvest Lane private road amendment. Number eight, the BA District 100 seat restaurant zoning amendment, followed by public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. So, approval of the minutes. Anyone, any comments, any questions about the minutes? Carolyn, would you like to make a motion? Make a motion we approve the minutes from the March 18th meeting as presented. Second. Thank you. <coughs> any discussion then? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining. Thank you. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the Hills Mitchell Highland Subdivision Amendment. Eric Hills is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Mitchell Highland Subdivision to divide a lot located at 27 Kildare Road to create a second lot with proposed access to Astor Lane. This will, this will be reviewed under section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision and there will be a public hearing. Hi, Bob. If you want to begin. Oh, actually, Maureen, did you have a brief presentation? I do. I'm moving along so quickly, I skipped that's, you. That's, I, it was really fast, that's all. Uh, just to orient the board, uh, this property is located in the Residence C District, where the minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet. Um, and you can create a lot that's smaller than that if it's in a clustered subdivision. So this is amendment of the Mitchell Highland subdivision, which was a traditional subdivision. That means that you had to meet the minimum lot size. There was no real open space requirement. And that was approved in the 1960s. And the, the proposal is to divide what was an oversized lot at the time into two lots that are at least 20,000 square feet each. Functionally, the lot looks like it's going to be in the Cottage Brook subdivision, but this is only an amendment to the Mitchell Highland subdivision to add a lot. Um, and access is proposed to be on Astor Lane, which is not a public road right now, but is intended to be a public road as part of the Cottage Brook subdivision and um, when it's dedicated to be accepted by the town. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good evening, members of the board. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell & Associates, representing uh, Eric Hills in this application. Uh, the last time we were before the board, we had presented a number of items that uh, Maureen had asked in her previous letter to be corrected. One was to take the designation under the zoning of the open space out, and now is corrected to the correct designation, and also to correct the setback side and rear setbacks, and those have been changed on the plan. Uh, essentially, as Maureen had indicated, this is an existing lot in the uh, Mitchell Highland subdivision. As you can point here, as you can see, the highlighted area. This is the particular lot in question. Kildare comes this way. The Cottage Brook subdivision is located on this side of, to the uh, to the left. This is an overview of your tax map showing the uh, the location, of the lots. Uh, the existing lot 46 is a 47,366 square foot parcel. What's being proposed is to carve that into two lots. Lot 46, which will be the retaining parent parcel, will be on Kildare, which will have 40, um, have, excuse me, have 27,000, I just lost myself, I shouldn't have looked up, 27,166 square feet, and 46A will have 20,200 square feet. The minimum frontage requirement of 100 feet will be met on Astor Lane. It will actually have 107 feet of frontage along Astor Lane. This is the one that's currently under construction as part of Cottage Brook. And then the existing frontage on Kildare is the same frontage as it had existed when the lot was originally created. 
Uh, I know one of the issues that we had discussed before was the issue of having access and frontage rights on Astor, where it's currently private and under construction. Uh, we had presented to the board several conditions of approval uh, at the last session with the board, as well as a letter from the developers of Cottage Brook, who indicated that they intend on proposing a requesting, or excuse me, submitting a request to the town either sometime late this summer or early fall for a town takeover. The road is fully bonded. It has to be completed and constructed to the town's specifications. Uh, if the developer doesn't fall, fall through that, the bond picks up on that. So they have documented and that they have no issue with uh, this lot having access to Aster. Uh, the developer is also going to be providing utility stubs from Aster Lane right up to the right-of-way line to serve public water, sewer, uh, power, telephone, uh, and cable. And those will all be underground stubs for the uh, utilities as well uh, for sewer and water. Uh, we had some initial discussions with the, power, the uh, public works director and that is not an issue in terms of a field change for the developer to be able to put those stubs across as will be part of a public right of way. Uh, the conditions that we had put on there was the that no lot could that lot excuse me the lot could not be sold or built, built on until such time as Astor Lane was accepted as a town road. Uh, the other condition that we had put on there was in regards to the open space impact fee. Uh, we would requested since there is no intention of Mr. Hills to turn around either build and or sell this parcel at this point, uh, we put a condition on there requesting that that impact fee be waived until such time as either the lot is sold or a building permit is obtained. And those notes have been added to the uh, subdivision plot as conditions uh, that we provided the last time. We haven't modified the language since the last time around since there was <laughs> Hello. no uh, comments from the board or staff that we've received in terms of the language. So with that, I think that's a, an overview. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Um, does the board have any questions right now for the applicant? Otherwise, I'm going to open the public hearing. No, then at this time, I will open the public hearing. If anyone would like to come forward to... Um, address this issue. Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. And I'll ask the board again, any questions, comments? Seeing none, would anyone like to make a motion? Would you? Thank you, Liza. Motion for the board to consider. Findings of fact. Eric Hills is requesting an amendment to the Mitchell Highland subdivision approved by the planning board in phases in the, in the 1960s to divide lot 46 into two lots, which requires review under section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Lot 46A will functionally become part of, Cottage Brook, part of the Cottage Brook neighborhood and will have access to Astor Lane which is proposed to become a public road, but has not yet been submitted to the town council for acceptance. Number three, the Cape Elizabeth subdivision ordinance includes an open space impact fee provision that applies to new subdivision lots. And number four, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Eric Hills for an amendment to the Mitchell Highland subdivision approved by the planning board in phases in the 1960s to divide lot 46 into two lots be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that an open space impact fee in the amount of $6,729 be paid to the town of Cape Elizabeth for, de for deposit in an account dedicated to open space preservation prior to the issuance of a building permit or the sale of the lot. Number two, that there be no sale of the lot or issuance of a building permit until Astor Lane has been accepted by the town council as a public road. And number three, that the above conditions be added to the subdivision recording flat. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And the motion has a passed. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, Maureen, I'm in trouble again. It's right underneath the one you were using on the desktop. On the left hand side, the other top. Oh, you want to just put yeah, close that? Yeah, we're just going to close it. Oh, sorry. See, Max and I get along real well. The next item on the agenda is the Jordan Subdivision Amendment. <clears throat> Philip Jordan and Chelsea Hughes are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Jordan Subdivision to change the length and the slope of the proposed road and to eliminate the public water line. This will be reviewed under Section 16-2-5, Submission Amendment, and this will be for completeness this evening. Victoria? Okay. Oh, yes. yes. Carolyn? Yes. 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 I would recuse myself from hearing this item as I am one of the owners of the subdivision. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, I do. You have an overview. Um, so this project is located in the Residence B District, which is the town's growth area district. Um, it, it is in a subdivision that has been previously approved as a three-lot clustered subdivision where there was a set aside for open space preservation. Uh, the proposed amendment does not increase this, the number of lots. It's the same as, as uh, was originally approved. But the proposal is, is basically to shorten the amount of road that would be built while still providing the minimum amount of frontage required by the ordinance. Uh, there is also an elimination of a turnaround at the end of the road. And I believe you've received a memo from the fire chief that the new road stub would be 120 feet long and he feels comfortable that he doesn't need a turnaround on a road that is that length. He can just back up. Um, and the other change is to eliminate the public water line that was proposed in the um, original approval and go with well water. And in the last day, I believe you have received some information that the applicants have submitted about water, potential water quality and water quantity for that area. Uh, you've also received a, a new piece of information that uh, formally connects the applicants to the record owners of the property. Thank you. Good evening again. I'm Bob Metcalf, this time representing uh, Phil Jordan and Chelsea Hughes on their uh, proposed amendment for the uh, Jordan subdivision. Uh, the photo behind you is just an aerial just to give you some context of where we're talking about. This is Spurwink Road. This is Wells Road. The farm stand is over in here. This is Deer Run Road. The uh, Hockey Pond Road is off of, which is in this location in here. Uh, as Maureen indicated, uh, we had received approval on this back in 2006 and then subsequently amended in 2007 to phase the improvements of the plan. Uh, the three lots that, are, that were approved uh, were for the grandchildren of the, the, uh, the, the Jordans. And the first lot that was built was lot number one, and that was built uh, several years back. The improvements that were done really were just modifications to part of Deer Run, the connection up to here, and then the construction of the house, and immediately some of the improvements on Hockey Pond Road. Uh, because of the overriding cost is the reason we came back the last time to phase this plan, and subsequent to that, we're coming back again to amend it because the overall cost to construct the road as originally designed uh, due to ledge and a few other issues uh, it's rather cost prohibitive for the nature of being able to develop the last lot down being number three. Uh, the original design, the way it had been done, was to address some agricultural uses in the field at the time. Uh, they had the raspberry patches that were up in this area and here, so when we did the drainage, we had to be able to bypass all the drainage by the field so that nothing was coming out into the field. And that's why we had an extended area that basically came down past, or originally came all the way down to the end of lot three and the water was then discharged back out to a, uh, a knoll area on the farm field. Uh, those have changed. Uh, there's no longer the raspberry patch in there. And uh, to avoid ledge removal, which is rather costly, uh, we're looking at raising the grade of the road in order to minimize that impact and as well as shorten the length of the road because no longer is it needed to access uh, parts of the farm that were under the original concept that when we had it approved. So we've shortened the road 
right of way to provide 55 feet of frontage for lot three, where 50 is the minimum <coughs> required. The f and the turnaround that was located in this area in here. And actually, why don't I do this? This was the original plan as approved, where you can see where the right of way came almost the full length of what is lot three. And the turnaround was here. We had ditches on both sides to be able to convey all the water down to this lower area in here. And that is no longer necessary. And by raising the road, we're actually able to avoid having to go to such an extensive amount of ditch uh, construction, uh, which is what one of the issues was also removing some of the trees that were within the right of way and subsequently required street trees. And I'll get to that uh, in a minute. So the road really has been. Okay, now why is it not? There we go. The road has been shortened, so it's just past where the driveway will be to serve the lot. And the grading now is such that half of the roadway will now sheet flow towards the field. The other half is picked up by a ditch line that is not quite as deep as before. We've raised the, ro the road base up to about a little over two feet in some areas as we get to the end. And then we drop back down towards into the, uh, the existing tote road that serves access to the farm. Uh, the drainage on this side of the road comes down. We have a culvert that takes it back across and basically discharges it in the same general area as the previous grading plan had in terms of a discharge point. Uh, a couple of things that, uh, as Maureen had indicated before, the uh, plan had been approved with public water to serve the subdivision and primarily that was due to consideration that the board had at the time there's a balance of the property that extends off in this direction here it is a significant amount of acreage there's no intent to develop that at this point at the time the board asked for the water to be extended to that point and they were looking at having the three lots served by public water the existing water line, and I can't see on this scale, roughly in this location here, there's an existing hydrant, so the main comes all the way up to the hydrant. The water line is going to be extended here. If in the event in the future the land is ever decided for determination to be developed further, it's not that great of a distance to be able to run public water up there and to continue it on the other side. So at this point, we're asking for vacating of that requirement for the public water service to serve the three lots. Lot one has an existing, has, is constructed and has its own on-site well, of uh, which, as Maureen indicated, we submitted information that I believe you've been provided with that was the well, drill, well driller's information in terms of the output for the well as well and testing of the quality of the water that you've been provided with. Excuse me, Bob. Yeah. That test is just for that well on the long line? That is correct. Okay. You know. And typically, what, you know, for information to support water availability and quality, you'd be looking for a well driller to provide you that information. You wouldn't be drilling a well to find out whether or not you had it. So that's better information than you normally have. You usually wind up with a well driller in the general vicinity that's done wells in that area to provide documentation. This is as close as you can get to give you a little more accurate information in terms of availability and the quality of the water. So. A couple of the points that Maureen had raised uh, were in regards to the first 50 feet of deer run that is to be paved. Uh, right now it's a reclaimed asphalt. In fact, it almost looks like it's just a poor paving job. It's just that it bound up very well and it almost looks like finished pavement. That area will be improved as part of this work that's done to extend hockey pond. Uh, the other issue was in terms of the monumentation. There was a note on a question from Maureen regarding the establishment of the granite monuments. Uh, we will correct the legend on the plan. It shows on the plan as a dark square. Those are monuments to be set. Uh, we'll correct that, and those monuments will be set as part of the improvements uh, to the beginning of Deer Run. The boundary lines and pins for the existing for the three lots have already been set, so those are already in place. In regards to uh, the waivers uh, that we had asked for in terms of the street trees, uh, the last time 
we were before the board with that application. As I said, we were going to wind up basically eliminating everything within the right of way due to the cut that was required to get the correct grade base per town specifications. By raising the road, we've been able to minimize that amount of cut because we're really more in a fill situation. So the, there are some significant tr oak trees that are along the boundary line. And the fact that we're not extending further down along the frontage of lot three, uh, requesting a waiver of that. Uh, there are several significant trees that the applicants are proposing to flag and identify that they will be retained. Uh, they're obviously a lot more significant in their presence than a two inch caliper tree being stuck, planted within the right of way. Uh, and those will be identified uh, to be protected during, uh, during construction. So that's the waiver for the trees. In regards to several of the comments that were raised, I can go through those uh, if you'd like. Uh, there were a couple of spelling errors that evidently were on the subdivision survey plan that were done when we did back in 2006 that were just caught now, so we've corrected those. Uh, it was in regards to, and I'm not sure I'll pronounce this right, Kerkarian. We have misplaced an A and an I. We've flip-flopped those. That's been corrected, and a page reference was corrected. And then on the Murray property, a book, book page number, that was transposed as well, and that's been corrected. Um, plan sheets two and three have been revised to show the approved road width. The road was originally approved as an 18-foot wide travel way with two-foot gravel shoulders, and that will still be the, the design for the roadway. And those notes have been added, added to the plan. Uh, surveyor notes, there were a duplicate note four and note six on both the... Uh, Subdivision plan, exist, uh, existing conditions plan, uh, we've eliminated the duplicate note, uh, note number six. Uh, we just talked about the, uh, the granite monumentation and adding that to the legend. Uh, the fire chief's comment in terms of a WB40 training movement, we've looked at that in terms of the template of the truck backing up, occupying basically what it is if they come back to this portion of the farm road that goes down towards the pond, and they can be able to make that turn at that location. So. Uh, AMEC had uh, a series of comments in their letter. First one, there was no response required. Uh, the second was in regards to the potable water and not waiving it at this point. We have submitted that information, so there's really no response required for that particular one. Uh, the raised in question number four is in regards to erosion with the outfall end of the culvert that's going underneath the farm road. We're taking the drainage off into the farm field. We have uh, modified the, up, the apron outfall and the detail to address that comment. And on the inlet side, there's a question about the water bypassing beyond the culvert. And it's just the topographical drafting error in there. And the, grading has been changed in that location, so basically what you create is a depression that as the water comes down, it hits into that pocket, goes into the culvert, so it does not pass on by. So we've addressed that, that specific question. Uh, there was another comment, number five, regarding a uh, 12-inch culvert is being proposed across Deer Run into this corner of Hockey Pond. <clears throat> the purpose of that culvert is uh, currently the farm operation extends the irrigation line to the pond in order to get irrigation for the field. And rather than having an irrigation line laying over the road, which currently does happen, uh, they want to install a 12-inch culvert just to convey a line through that, basically sleeve it, in order to have the, uh, the irrigation line go through. The road is owned by the farm, and the question was raised of an easement being required. Uh, don't really see the need for that. It's not conveying water, it is just a means of making egress across that road less cumbersome if you have a conduit line laying across the top for an irrigation line. So we're requesting that that not be a requirement uh, to provide an easement for that activity. The other comment, comment seven, was in regards to a PE stamp on the, on the drawings. Uh, that has been added to the plan, and actually it's kind of cut off in the lower corner down here. Uh, BH2M, who had done the, uh, the stormwater review um, uh, for this project originally and followed up with the revised changes on this, has stamped the plan. 
Uh, also, uh, as a comment in terms of the survey stamp on the subdivision plan, that will be done. We didn't have them stamp it at this point. We just wanted to get to the point if there were any notes or anything that need to be added to the subdivision plan. But that survey stamp will be added to that. Uh, the other comment eight was to add the, the name of Hockey Pond Road to Plan Sheet 2 that has been added, as well as we've actually added Deer Run uh, on the Deer Run Road section, which was not on the plan, so we've added that as additional information. And since we received the original approval on this, the pavement thickness um, for the paved end of Deer Run has from, gone from two inches to two and a half, and we've modified that detail to bring that up to the current town standard. So. Uh, given that, I know this is for completeness, uh, given that the modifications to this plan are minor in nature, uh, they really have no significant impact on any abutters, and since the abutter, primary abutter is the farm, uh, and due to scheduling issues and concerns of trying to be able to move forward with their plans to construct their home, uh, we're asking the board's consideration to actually vote on this application this evening if you would do such. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, at this time, though, I do want to open it up for uh, completeness. I want to see if anyone, if um, anyone at this time in the public would like to come forward and talk about whether or not this application is complete for the board to look at. This is your opportunity. And seeing none, we're going to close that portion. Okay. And. Um, anyone on the board about completeness? Any comments, Elaine? Um, I guess my only question is whether, in fact, the information that we have on lot one is, from a technical point of view, sufficient or not to establish uh, quality and sufficiency of water for lots two and three. I think that's more. It, it's a technical question. I'm not sure that I have in front of me the information to answer that question, but perhaps Maureen does. And the other outstanding issue is I have in front of me um, the letter from Peter Gleason. And it doesn't sound to me like he's saying that he can just back out without a turnaround. It sounds to me like he's saying he needs a turnaround, but there is an existing one as long as it, it's, and it's adequate if it meets the B40 standards, and I haven't seen anything about the location of an existing turnaround as opposed to just backing out, and whether or not what's there meets the B40 standards. So those are just factual questions. <coughs> Any information about how we should proceed on there's a question about the well. Well, we, we don't normally see a lot of information about well water because 98 to 99 percent of the town has public water. Right. Um, it is, I, short of drilling your own well, it, it's t pretty typical to try to get information from other areas that are similar to yours to determine what you expect your, your water quality to be. So um, I think probably what you have is sort of what you're going to get. Okay. Um, on the, the email from Peter Gleason, uh, and I'm going to let I'm going to let Bob take care of most of that. But I think what we were saying about the existing turnaround is when you head west on uh, Deer Run Road, you get to the end of Deer Run Road and you can turn north or you can turn south. And uh, right now it's built so that the southern end, the little stub of the southern end of Hockey Pond Road, also functions as a turnaround. And I think if you build the southern end of Hockey Pond Road, then what happens is the little stub north of Deer Run on Hockey Pond ser serves as a turnaround. Would that be fair? That is fair. Basically, right now, what you have here, this is an existing farm. Ooh, reverberation here. This is an existing farm road that goes down to the pond that's back in this location in here. So it's almost the full width uh, in this location. In the improvements that are done up on this end, basically what I took from Peter's email is that he'd have the ability to back up to here and then make his turn back out. And we've thrown a WB40 template on there, and it does have that turning. I mean, we can provide that as a condition for approval, that documentation, 
Okay, so, and so that's the B40 standard, the template that's that correct, yes. goes on the existing yep. road. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Sure. Yes, Liza. Um, how could we ensure that that stub on the farm road is plowed in the winter? Would that be included in the agreement, the shared road maintenance agreement? I don't think the applicant have any problem making that a condition of approval to keep that open. They plow, they plow everything right now, so. Okay. Yes, Peter. Uh, I think you mentioned it, I didn't catch it. The, um, the applicants are not the owners of the property, and there was some document that tied the owners to the applicants. You have it here. You have something? I thought you had received that. I had. I remember getting, receiving an email. Okay. I, I okay. I was having um, trouble opening something. That's all taken care of. Right. I have a letter here, which I'm happy to share with you, that is Maureen, as the owners of the Jordan subdivision in Cape Elizabeth, we give Philip Jordan permission to take matters concerning plan modifications to planning board for the site plan review process. Lot three of the subdivision will be conveyed to Philip within the next few months. Thank you for passing this along to the planning board. Best regards, William Jordan, Jr., Pamela Butterfield, Carol Ann Jordan, and Penelope Jordan. So, okay. Anyone else on completeness? What the completeness? You have enough information in front of you to proceed. Okay. Um, then, at this point, would um, motion. motion for uh, completeness? Anyone like to make a motion? Thank you, Joe. Motion for the board to consider. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Philip Jordan and Chelsea Hughes for amendments to the previously approved Jordan Farm subdivision to shorten the length and change the grade of Hockey Pond Road and eliminate the public water line be deemed complete. Do I see a second on that? Um, sure. And any discussion? All those in favor? Completeness? Okay, that's unanimous. All right then, then it's deemed complete and at this point we can begin substantial discussion. And um, I just wanted some clarification about sure. phasing one and phasing two. Um, give me a moment to refer to my notes. Let's see, uh, I have a note about sheet two. Okay. On sheet two, uh, let's see. You did say then on sheet two that um, where it shows the um, detail plan for Spurwink Avenue intersection on sheet two. You did say you will be paving. That will be first. paved as part so of this. That's a to-do. And um, replace rebar with granite monuments. And yeah, those are the two granite monuments at that intersection. That's a to-do? Yes. Okay. Uh, a stop sign? That's all a to-do? Well, it's on your plan. stop sign up? Yeah. check that one. So, um, this whole thing is uh, to do. So we consider that phase two then? They were part of the part phase, of phase two improvements one. and this is what those improvements will be done as part of the improvements to extend Hockey Pond Road. Okay, so those all need to be done. Yeah, and the, you don't have it on that set of plans. We've modified those notes to say to be completed. I can't remember my note now and I can't see from here because it's been added on to this plan, but basically to be completed as part of the work for instructional. Okay. Development a lot. I just wasn't clear on, um, th there was no note on phasing and, and I wasn't clear was this done or not done. Right. So I no, I know Maureen had that question and I, re we've revised it on the plans, you just haven't received a set of revised plans. <laughs> Apologize for not addressing that completely. Okay. Uh, on sheet three, what is the width of Deer Run Road? Deer Run? Yeah, that's me that one. 
Oh, it varies? Okay. It does vary. I think at the widest point down near Spurl, it's at 15. It narrows and then widens back up to the area that was extended. Tie in the hockey pond was widened back up. sections of that are only 14 feet wide existing mm -hmm. and then it was widened back out to the piece that was extended from the existing driveway that service the Murray property that was pushed up to the 18 feet wide so the portion that was uh, done when lot one was developed was widened out to the 18 feet Thank you. Anyone else have any questions that we'll bring on? To yes, Elaine. I have a question on two things. First is on street trees. And I see a note here that says, where possible existing trees will be preserved and required street tree, street tree location shall be reviewed if different from what's shown on the plan. And I'm not exactly sure what you're intending to show on the plan, because it seems like you're just showing an unspecified existing line of, of forest. And I'm wondering if that's really adequate to, to what you said, which is that you would identify specific trees. We'll actually go out and flag, and actually I believe Phil's already done this. He's gone along the boundary line and actually selected <laughs> There is, as I said, there are rather significant trees that along that road frontage, and we've talked about within that 20 feet, right up to the right of way edge as close as we can, along that frontage of where the road goes in, identifying existing mature trees that will be saved. And yeah. normally, we would have the opportunity to see those trees. So if you're asking for a complete approval tonight, we don't have the opportunity to see those trees and to see that they're an adequate line of trees being preserved and so that's I'm a little concerned about that the other question that I had is when we talked about this in workshop whatever we were doing tonight was not going to affect positively or it was really going to leave the status quo for lot one and if I understand you properly you're now asking us to basically um, correct any violation that might exist on lot one by blessing the well that's there and that was I not want to that was that, is that in fact what you're doing that was not my intent the question okay. was maureen had asked us to provide documentation that would support the ability to put a potable well on that site as well as water quality and as i indicated in my presentation typically in situations you wind up finding a well driller who's done work in the immediate area that can certify that there is available water and that it will meet the quality requirements. In this particular case, we had the information that was done for the well on lot one, which puts you within a couple of hundred feet of where their well would be, and that gives you much better documentation to support that they have the ability to draw water and it will meet the water quality standards. So, so I guess my concern is it doesn't seem to me to make sense for us to leave it ambiguous as to whether the public water requirement applies or doesn't apply to lot one. Um, maybe that's what we should do since lot one isn't in front of us. But if we're not impacting lot one, one way or the other, I think we need to say it explicitly, particularly since we knew, do now have in front of us water quality information from lot one. I think we have to say something about the impact on lot one. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty hard to figure out the status of what lot one okay. as to water. And I don't know, Maureen, if you have a suggestion, but I don't think we can just leave it. I, I, I guess my feeling is there seems to be a lot of little loose details right. tonight. Right. And 
the applicant might be able to take care of a lot of this stuff if they had a month to work on it. Well, makes sense to me. So that we would table it tonight rather than move to the next phase tonight. I mean, and before we get there, though, I just want to make sure, does anyone else have any comments before we talk about a uh, site walk or tabling this? Does anyone else have any comments? I'd like to have a sidewalk, a site walk, and I'm in favor. Okay, no other comments? We're on to site walk. Um, I believe you'd like that site walk, too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're going to be scheduling a site walk, so this will be going on to a public hearing All right. May Second. You, and only in deference, because they are on our time crunch. I'd appreciate any other feedback you have. I mean, I think we've addressed the comments that have been raised by engineering and by Maureen. I understand the few that Elaine have and that Liza had uh, to be able to address. I mean, I really want to be able to have a plan ready to actually even take on a site walk and show you how we've addressed everything to be able to expedite this thing and move it forward, because timing is an issue for them. Okay. Can you put the trees that we're going to that you're going to identify on a, on the site plan? We can do the best of our ability. They won't be a survey location, but we can do a takeoff by tape and identify where they'll fall. Okay. okay. And then we'll have them flagged so that when you go to the site walk, you see which ones we're talking about saving. Was there anything else anyone wanted to see on the plan? So we can move that along. No. Okay. Then let's schedule the site walk. Everyone get out their calendar. Just for reference, the uh, submission deadline for the May 22nd meeting is May 2nd. Okay. And this time of year, it might be possible to do it on a weeknight as well as the usual weekend. Mm -hmm. What works best for people? What are people thinking? Sooner rather than later? Soon. Friday morning. This Friday morning? This coming? Early. What are um, suggested time? <laughs> I'm out of, I'm out of town. Okay. Oh. Until the 24th. Okay. So the 25th, you could do it. Yeah. 25th being the next. It's a week from Friday, but it's the last day of school vacation week. Here. We're, yeah, by the uh, 18th, the kids are out of school anyways. So it is a school vacation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 25th, it's of vacation week. If anyone else is going to be out, I'm Joe, in. you're out. Okay. Anyone else out? No, okay. Um, let's see. Now, when are you back? 26? Saturday morning? We should report. Yes, if, if it comes down to that. I'm trying to. Get something that for everyone. No, I'm not back till the 27th. Okay. Everyone else is free for their other days? We, for which? Where are we? Which are we? We could try the 17th or we could try um, at the end of the weekday on the 28th, the 29th. Okay. The 18th, Eliza's out of town. That's okay, too. We can generate more. Yes, we could. Can you make the 18th, Elaine? I know you want. That is this coming Friday. That is this Friday. Yes. What and Henry? Henry? It's fine. You're okay. All right. What was the suggested time, Joe? Seven. Ten thirty. Seven. It's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like seven, well, Actually, numbers. seven o'clock would be fine. In the when? In the morning. Seven or seven thirty early. Early, early. 7.30. 7.30 is a little bit better. Henry, 7.30? And I normally sleep at that time. How about 8? Is 8 too late? Does 8? 8 work. Friday morning, 8 o'clock. 
That work for the rest? Bob and Bob, yes. You're right. So Friday, April 18th at 8 a.m. And um, you want to meet at the intersection of Deer Run and Hockey Pond? Or that seem reasonable? Sure. Everyone's got that information. Okay. Well, we'd like to. Then we will have the public hearing next month, also. Though that will be May 22nd. And then at this time, would anyone like to make a motion? I have a question. Oh yes. First. Yes. Um, you wanted. You were asking about all of the things you need to have on the plan. Uh, yes. on, on the site walk, I wouldn't think we'd be talking about lot one, but that is something I would be looking to have some clear statement about on the plan, what, the, what you're intending the impact of this to be on lot one. Um, and perhaps just that this in, does not impact the status of lot one, if that's your it, it has no impact on lot one whatsoever. The only request was that in a relationship to lot one is the public water, which we've asked for that to be vacated. Then and I would want to see a statement on the plan sure. to that effect. <laughs> Could I be? Yes. Or since the owner of lot one is related to the applicant, maybe mm -hmm. this is the time to correct any irregularity with lot one as part of this approval? I'll talk to you about that tomorrow. Okay. Anyone else? Then may I hear a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you. Um, motion to table public hearing. Um, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Philip Jordan and Chelsea Hughes for amendments to the previously approved Jordan Farm subdivision to shorten the length and change the grade of Hockey Pond Road and eliminate the public water line be tabled to the regular May 22, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Do we hear a second? Second. Thanks, Elaine. Any mo uh, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? And the motion passes. See you Friday morning. See you Friday morning. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the middle school boiler room site plan amendment. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the Cape Elizabeth school campus to construct a 1,050 foot square foot boiler room addition to the middle school located at 14 Scott Dyer Road. This will re be reviewed under section 19-9 site plan amendment and this is for completeness and a public hearing will be held tonight on this item. Maureen, would you like to? Sure. This, um, the school campus is in the town center district, and um, the school campus has been the subject of site plan approvals and amendments numerous times. So this is just the newest amendment. Um, they are proposing to add a boiler to the western side of the middle school. There is a letter you received today from the town engineer, and uh, there was a, some substantive information in there. The gist of that information is that there, there is right now pipes underground where the boiler room is proposed, and there was a recommendation by staff, of specifically the town engineer, the public works director, the fire chief, to not build a building on top of those pipes. Um, unfortunately, it's an extremely crowded area when it comes to underground pipes, and so um, some of the water, the old water line is being moved. 
Um, there is under, there's um, underground utility lines that are being moved, but there is a storm drain line that um, the town engineer and the public works director have agreed to change their recommendation from being moved out from under the building to leaving it where it is <coughs> with some special consideration for construction to try to not do anything to disturb that pipe in the future. So that's the most up-to-date information I have on that. That was sent to you um, late this afternoon. Yes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the facilities manager, Mr. Marles. Good evening. Thank you. I am Greg Marles. I'm the Capitals with Facilities and Transportation Director. Um, I do have a revised set of uh, plans that dict uh, depict what we've made for changes, which I'd like to give everybody. Uh, and we've made sufficient copies for the um, staff. Thank you. Sorry. Extras? I don't need. Just keep them and speak into the mic. So we've been uh, looking at you know, going through the suggestion, the, the uh, application, and the comments that were brought up at our last meeting. And we're going to review all of those as we go through. We're going to show you some pictures of what the proposed building looks like, what the changes of elevations look like. And at this time, I'm going to give it over to Frank Crabtree from Harriman, who will walk through the details of that. I'm Frank Crabtree with Harriman. Um, I thought I would just give you a brief overview of the project and then take a look at the questions that you had at the workshop and the questions that came through from the um, town engineer and then look at the waivers that we're requesting. Um, we have the revised plans and unfortunately I didn't email them to Greg so he didn't get them on the uh, view here but we do have them over here and you have them pretty much in your packet nothing substantially changed in the size of the building the shape even some notes and things like that that we've changed on the revised set so um, as, as we're looking at the uh, addition to the building is very small about a thousand square feet uh, tucked right up into the corner with the tech wing and the middle school um, and uh, I guess it was also mentioned that the building is uh, was displacing a water line uh, that was running under the building. The uh, storm line was also running under the building. We've chosen to leave it there. Uh, we felt we could work around it fine, and the, um, the town engineer has agreed, uh, which we can get into a little bit later. Uh, there's no impact to any of the, the parking, the maneuvering, because this is being, uh, yeah, we have it up here uh, as far as the overview. Uh, the, the little building addition is being placed in a grass area just off from the service yard where the dumpsters are, are stored. And uh, so it really is not impacting any parking, any circulation. Um, it's, it's just fit right into the corner there. The uh, style of the siding is intended to match. Uh, there are two different uh, views of that same siding, this brick and then there is a higher panel on the existing two buildings and we're using the same idea on this new building. I'll bring up the, we have an image of what it would look like from Scott Dyer which I'm going to bring up right now. So if you actually look there you can't really see it but the addition is right there. So what our intent was is to match the view from the road to the existing building, which is the old tech wing, so that it, it blends in. So it's not as noticeable from the, from the road at all. Yeah, the distance is about 400 feet. And we really felt that we wouldn't uh, see much. Uh, and as we sketched it in, we, we agreed, yeah, we really don't see much. 
especially since you've turned it off. Well, I was going to get oh. the other view. Um, then the other view we looked at is driving up the service drive uh, towards the addition. Uh, again, which is a, a lot closer, with probably about uh, 50 or 100 feet. Um, here's the addition here, and the you can see the, the siding on the uh, tech wing is this tannish gray color. Uh, it's also the same as the strip along the top of the middle school, and the brick base is a... Um, a height here which is lower and a little bit higher here. So we've kind of matched, gone between the two, uh, but as Greg said, the view from the street is the view we were more concerned about matching and um, it matches very closely. That was one of the questions that was asked at the workshop. <coughs> uh, the other question was snow plowing. Do you want to discuss that? I can. Um, currently, uh, with this new building configuration, as you can see, we, we have the snow there, which we've had plenty of this year. Um, I'm sorry, I the mic again. As you can see, we pile the snow to the right of the service entrance. We also go to the left, which is a fire lane that we keep open all the way to the front of the building, and it also gets piled in that area. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have this area that we store snow here. We have areas that go all the way down through here that we store snow. Um, we used to, uh, a couple of years back, sto uh, store snow right where this building is. That cr posed another problem for us, and that was access actually to the roof. So we stopped plowing snow towards that area a few years ago. <clears throat> so this building doesn't impact the way we currently plow our properties. Um, it, 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 and as, as Frank said, we're taking up a small grassed area right here to uh, allow for the uh, construction of this building. <clears throat> yes, I received an, an email about a concern about uh, noise from the new boiler plant. And uh, <clears throat> the, the new boiler plant, the actual sound that is going to be generated from that, as you have any kind of equipment, at the property line, based on all of our computer modeling, is 19 decibels, which is well below the required decibel level. Um, the other question was that they, uh, the the qu that came to us is they heard a ventilation system. I don't have a ventilation system here at all. That's a fresh air intake. Uh, in further meeting with the, or t discussing this with the person who had brought up the concern, on the end of this wing, which you can't see is over here, is an old dust collection system from when we had an industrial arts program. That sounds like a jet engine when it runs. We no longer have the industrial arts program. That has been off. I've been here four years and it's never run in the four years that I've been here. So. Um, we did meet, I did meet and discuss this with the, the, um, the abutter and they were quite happy with what we were producing, or well, lack of producing in this case. Yeah, let me just go through the, the other Oops. comments, the ones that, uh, that the, uh, Steve Harding sent in. And um, question number one uh, is just a statement of the small uh, 740 square foot impact of impervious, uh, which he agreed um, in his second um, item that uh, it was very minor, very negligible as far as stormwater goes so that there's no, no formal stormwater would be required. Um, his item number three talks about adding grades and um, we, the, the building is very small and it's, it's in a very uh, tight area where we're matching. When we saw cut the pavement here on the road, we obviously have to match right back in again. When we cut the walk over here, and we match down here. We're, we're matching all over around this little building. Um, we did go in and we've put in spot grades, which indicates to the contractor his target grade, but we keep the note 
match because it's imperative that they match all those grades exactly. So we've gone in and we've added some detail. We've added a uh, uh, temporary benchmark for the inside the floor um, of the existing building for them to use. So uh, we've met that requirement that Steve had. Uh, number four is the, uh, sto the storm pipe issue that we've talked about with Steve and we got um, uh, resolved today in the, the final email that I believe you got in your packets. And basically, <coughs> um, the storm line runs beneath the building and it's, um, it also runs beneath the existing building over here, the tech wing. Steve's comment was for future maintenance, it would be better to have it outside of the building footprint. And typically when you're designing a new building, a new site and everything, you try to do those avoidances. Here it was in such a congested area with a buried oil tank, propane tanks, a fire hydrant, new water lines, that we felt it would be better just to leave it and to box out the foundation so as not to put load on that pipe, which is a very standard common practice. And when we sent a sketch to Steve later, uh, or earlier this morning, he said yes, that would work. And um, he felt that that would be fine. Just a question, what do you do if you do have a problem? Do you take, take the floor up to sort it out under there? No, I think if they had a problem uh, under any situation like this, they'd have to, <coughs> they'd have to go down outside the building and reroute the pipe at that point in time. In other words, cut the pipe outside the building on each side, block it, and then rerun it around the building, which is what we would be doing now. But the discussion was, why do it now in anticipation of that little 30 feet of pipe being a problem sometime in the future, you know, when it, you know, likelihood is it won't. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what we've discussed. And, <coughs> uh, didn't want to add more money into the project as well. So, okay. yeah. Um, his um, item number five, uh, the specific light fixture. We have uh, three light fixtures, um, which are going to be on, one on each side of the building. And the uh, catalog cut of that light fixture is in your packet but Steve felt that it all also should be on the drawing. So on the new drawing uh, that, that uh, Greg has just handed out, um, C00.2, which is the details, we have added a detail for that fixture, which is sort of a little um, trapezoidal sharp cutoff fixture. Uh, it's an LED fixture. Uh, it's right at the top of that page. Uh, we have that. Okay, we do have it. Um, so right up at the top of the page is that light fixture. Again, it, it was in the packet all along. It's just that Steve felt it should be on the drawing. So we put the, uh, the important pieces of the note on the drawing. And his item number six, we should add MDOT <coughs> details for the materials for pavement and gravel uh, down in the corner. Right here is the um, pavement detail for both uh, the driveway and the walks. And we've, <coughs> we've added the notes, which again, were in our bid specifications to the contractor. The, the detail was already there for the contractor. But again, Steve said, well, it should also be on the drawing. So now it's on the drawing as well. Um, so those are the comments and how we have addressed them all. Um, and then finally, the waivers that we have asked for. There are five, and uh, the first one is evidence of title right and interest. And we asked for a waiver there because um, it, it, one thing this 
this parcel, uh, this building is nowhere near any of the property lines. We're 400 feet from the nearest property line. And it is evidently, I mean, known to be the town property. And we just said, you know, <coughs> we don't really want to reproduce a whole bunch of paper in your packet if we don't need to. And we felt that waiver was reasonable. Uh, the second waiver is item um, under the submission requirement number three, the um, neighboring properties, um, because again, we're, um, it requir requires anything within 200 feet, and we're 400 feet from the nearest property line. So again, we felt all the names and addresses of all the property owners around the parcel is a bit excessive, but you know, we could do it if we needed to, but we're asking for that waiver because, you know, it's just not, we didn't figure really it was a, applicable. Um, <coughs> lot line dimensions, again, the same idea that we are building well within any lot lines. Um, the, there is a plan which was uh, done the first time, I think, in 1994 with the construction of the middle school. Uh, that has all that data on it, and it is in the files. Um, Marines looked at it with me. Um, so that data exists, it's just we didn't feel we needed to reproduce it for this tiny little project, um, again, in the packets. Uh, landscaping and buffering. Uh, there are no landscape plants, as you could probably see in those two images. This one here is a little hard to see, but there really is nothing for landscaping. Uh, it I was going to change it for well. Really. <laughs> Good timing. Uh, the view from either the street or coming up close. There there's no, there's no landscaping anywhere around. <coughs> so we didn't feel that because we're not disturbing any. We also weren't planning any that we would ask for a waiver of that. And <coughs> and the noise uh, measurement. <clears throat> requirement. We asked for a waiver for that as well. Um, <coughs> and again, being 400 feet from the nearest property line, and the, uh, the construction will be limited to the hours that the town requires. And there's, there's not a noise generating building. Uh, so again, we'd ask for a waiver of that. And those, I believe, are the five items we're asking to waive. Now, the first item for us to look at is completeness. Does anyone have any comments, questions for the applicant in regards to completeness? Okay. Then at this time, um, I do want to open it up to see if anyone else in the public would like to, any comments, questions about completeness? Seeing none, we'll come back to the board. And then um, would... Um, I'd like to take a motion on this. Would anyone like to? Thank you, Carol Ann. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved school campus site plan to add a 1,050 square foot boiler room to the west side of the middle school be deemed complete. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Joe. Okay, all those in favor? All right, so it has been deemed complete. All right, and then, anyone have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. It's not totally related to the um, completeness or the uh, application, but what fuel will this boiler run on? It runs on number two heating oil. Oh, okay. Isn't the town going to get natural gas? In the I think that's one of the things we're working towards. Uh, the particular plants that we put in are convertible. Yes, thank you. Anyone else have any comments or questions on the application? No? Okay. I'm going to then open this again to the public. Does the public have any comments, questions on this? Public hearing. Mm -hmm. public hearing. Yeah, this is a public hearing at this time. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. Okay, and I'll bring it back to the board again. No further comments, then do I hear a motion? Mm -hmm. Yes, Peter. The motion for approval. <coughs> Finding the fact that the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the previously approved school 
campus site plan to add a 1,050 square foot boiler room to the west side of the middle school, which required a review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, the town's engineer comments included re revisions to the plan. Three, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved school campus <coughs> site plan to add a 1,050 square foot boiler room to the west side of middle school be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated April 9, 2014. And I guess we should say as and, am and amended as subsequently amended. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, two, the plan include notes indicating the existing utility lines will be located outside the building footprint. Is that still? Uh, you mentioned the the, the pipe yes. was was going to stay where it was. Is that all utilities? The water line uh, we had moved previously. Okay that went under the building and reconnected it outside the building to the hydrant, uh, but the storm line was <coughs> moving under the building. Okay, storm line, other utilities are under the? No. Could no. so the water line, but I, if I could? Yes. Um, I'm looking at your site plan and there, the UC lines, can you pull it up? It looks like yeah. there's three or four of them. It looks like they're telephone lines. Yeah, those. You know which lines I'm talking about? I'll try to increase this here. Yeah, those conduits <clears throat> now come into the existing school. Um, right. Are they going to be removed? Thank they're you. not going to be removed. They're going to be stay connected. I'm not sure whether they're going to be rerouted. Um, Yes, I, think, I think they are. I, I'm not the electrical engineer, <laughs> so, but I know they've been addressed, but I can't tell you exactly how. They're, those lines are being rerouted to off to the side, which would be on our, our electrical details. So to follow up on that, the reason I had made that suggested condition to the board is because your written materials indicated they were going to be rerouted, but there's nothing on this plan that suggests they're going to be rerouted. So if there could just be a note added to this plan for the contractor to know that these are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. Yep, not a problem. Oh. So I guess that condition still is something the board may want to consider. Okay, as, as it now reads. As it now reads, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and three, <coughs> that the renewal duration of the site versions of the building permit until the plans have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town plan for review. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Oh, I'll go with Carol Ann. Okay, any comment on these questions? No, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Okay, that has been Thank approved. You. Thank you. Thank you. Apologize for the computer. I'm not used to an Apple. <laughs> kept tapping screens and it didn't go on. item on our agenda is the Tamaro Landscaping Summer Oven Site Plan. Uh, Nick Tamaro and Jennifer Feeney are requesting site plan review of the property located at 539 to 541 Ocean House Road, including the addition of the Summer Oven, a 26-seat restaurant. This will be reviewed under Section 19-9, Site Plan, and we're looking at completeness tonight. Maureen, do you have any an introduction for the board. Um, sure. Can you guys see this? Can you pull this out? 
Does it help? This is as good as it's going to get. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the site that has, it ha it's actually a complex of buildings. It's located in the Business A district on Route 77. And uh, right now there are ongoing businesses in, in the property. Um, the, the code officer has made a determination that the current status of the property is that everything falls under the village retail category. And there is an applicant who would like to open the summer oven and that is not within a village retail, that's within the restaurant category. So that's what triggered the question about site plan review. Uh, the situation is that the planning board granted site plan review for this site in 1989 and we do have on file a 1989 site plan. Um, however, there's also an existing uh, condition survey. When you compare the old site plan and the new survey, there's a lot of inconsistencies, which left the applicants with a choice. They could either um, come forward with an amendment to the 1989 plan and inventory all the inconsistencies, or they could come forward and say, we just want a brand new site plan approval of everything on the site. Um, I contacted Mr. Tamaro and he said, he wants a brand new site plan approval of everything on the site. Uh, the, the written materials suggest that this is really just an amendment and staff has reviewed it as if it is a new site plan. Okay, thank you. Yes. Good evening. Um, I am Jennifer Feeney. I'm representing Summer Oven and co-applicant with Nick Tamaro, the property owner of 539 through 541 Ocean House Road in Cape Elizabeth. Here. Are you all familiar from the workshop? So we are requesting um, site plan review for our proposed project, which will include a 26-seat restaurant, Summer Oven, in building number four of 541 Ocean House Road. We are proposing a change of use in building number four from village retail to village retail with the restaurant. We are also proposing a change of use in building number three from cold storage to small engine repair. And we are proposing an entrance relocation with curb closure. Okay. We have reviewed the town planner's um, comments and the town engineer's recommendations. And it is our intent to meet all the necessary requirements on the plan. We are working with John Leisure and Blaze Engineers <coughs> to provide the board with the required <coughs> items as soon as possible. So we appreciate your um, consideration in this and seeking completeness. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite anyone from the public, if you'd like to come forward in regards to completeness. Is the application complete for the board to review at this time? Would anyone like to come forward? Okay, seeing no one, I will close that section. And I'm gonna ask the board then. Yes, Carol Ann. I just wanna confirm that all seating for this restaurant is outside or is there in interior seating as well? There may be six seats inside and then the additional outside. Because it doesn't show on the plan that there's any it doesn't. seating inside. So that's just why I asked. Thank you. Does anyone have any uh, comments in regards to the plan that is in front of us as far as is this plan complete enough for us to now begin? Do we have everything we need in front of us, Elaine? So if I understand this properly, we are now being asked to give a new site plan approval for the whole site. I believe so. Okay, which I think means that all of the BA standards in terms of landscaping and the way that the buildings look and all apply to this project. Is that correct, Maureen? Okay, because it seems to me that we don't have all the detail that we would need to confirm that all of those standards are either met or not applicable 
because there, uh, there's a fairly extensive approval process that we have to go through for new things in the BA district. And I understand there's not a lot of new construction, but there is some new construction, and it doesn't seem like we have enough to allow us to go through all of those BA standards and make a finding. Um, but perhaps you could walk us through those standards. There uh, is no new construction. Yeah, currently there was construction that was done since 1989. When I took over the property, one of the things I had to do for the um, code enforcer was bring the site back up to par because a lot had been done without approval. And in doing that, I tore down two buildings and constructed a parking lot that was approved that never got done. The two buildings didn't have permits, so they had to be removed. And I felt it was easier to just go with that site plan, I'll fix it, I installed buffering that was never done, and just try to make it as clean as possible. Then when Jen approached me, we went to the town and we discussed what was the best route, and this time I felt it was good to just get a brand new site plan on five. And uh, so that's where we went. Um, as you know, by what you have seen, our, our drawing is not a computer-generated drawing. But as far as we understand, there is no requirement for it to be a computer-generated drawing or stamped by a civil engineer. Although it is. He's an architect. He's an architect that drew it. He drew us. the original site plan, and then we've worked with him on revising or creating an accurate site plan for in the engineer's um, comments from AMET, pretty much one through three are the, the nitty gritty, I guess, is, as I would put it, that we need to address. Four through 13 are minor changes. I don't know if any of you've had time to read them. One of them is just basically showing from three inches of asphalt to four inches. That's a minor change. I had that all done by Blaze Engineering, and uh, I've sat down with him. We went over these items, and um, they are not, none of them are a large project. They're, they're very simple, such as moving our driveway entrance five degrees one way versus the other, changing the asphalt depth, that sort of thing. So I really think four through 13 are, are fairly, um, we can go through them if that's what needs to be. Uh, you know, we can go through one by one and discuss them. Uh, I think more importantly, one through three are the ones that are, are you know, really what we need to think of the, the meat of the project, basically. We understand that they, there are, I, our intentions are to meet all of these requirements. And we should be, none of them look uh, too over the top to be able to do that by next month. Okay, that's good to hear. Does anyone on the board, though, have any... Um comments in regards to the plans that we do have in front of us um, to start reviewing this plan based on what you do have in front of you right now. Elaine has made a comment that these do, it, is this correct, Elaine, that they do seem incomplete at this time? When I'm looking at the BA requirements in the zoning ordinance, to me it doesn't seem that we have enough information to determine if this complies. And I'm looking for other opinions, comments. Well, I'm a little concerned about the length of the commentary by uh, the town engineer, including the observation that the plans are difficult to read. I mean, this, this isn't too good a start for evaluating the basically the uh, look at the Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, Peter, I did not catch all of what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, I was concerned by the length of the town engineer's letter and the number of items which the town engineer felt were un, uh, incomplete, and in, including the, the statement that the plan itself is difficult to read and understand. It's, I didn't think it was a terribly good way to start reconsideration of the uh, meeting of the requirements. Anyone else have any comments? Liza. Um, I agree that the plans are difficult to read. 
So, uh, then, um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it would be helpful to see elevations also and to have um, a version that shows the, the, the changes, both the existing and the proposed, on there. Then I'm going to be the fourth person to speak out and say that um, it, it's true we don't need to have something that's computer generated. What you brought to the workshop was actually very legible. Uh, these plans, however, um, it, it was actually, uh, you know, AMAC said that you were doing an amendment. They didn't even realize that this was a brand new set of plans. That's how they began their letter. And then they said, they are very difficult to read. And when we do go through and we look at plans, we are really looking for all that nitty-gritty detail to be on the plan. We, we know that you will put this on the plan, but when we begin this whole process, when we talk about completeness, we need to say, if the, if the applicant did not come back with that information, for whatever reason, I'm not saying that would happen in this case, but that's the standard. If the applicant didn't come back and we have found it complete, then we're saying we're going to work off of what has been presented to us. And the town engineer did have quite a list of items um, that they were looking for on the plan. Um, and we are looking to make sure you do meet the VA requirements. And there's a lot of information. Um, when I was picking up the plans, I usually go through these in fine detail, and I didn't even know where to begin. It was just, I can't read these as well. Um, I believe you're hearing that there's at least four people on the board then that are going to say this is incomplete because we are looking for that level of detail, whether it requires this is how it looks now, and then another set of plans saying these are the proposed changes instead of having them all on one plan, and just breaking them down so that we can look at all this level of detail, which is something I'm sure the town planner would gladly assist and say, this is what is typically asked for, and we could still work with you even with the architect that you're using instead of going to an engineer. Does anyone else want to add to these comments? No. Do you have a comment? Or? I have a question. Yes, certainly. Um, I understand that the plan, well, I, I guess I want to understand if you're referring to the detailed plans of the uh, curb closure and the drainage, and are you speaking of the overall plan? Like, which plan, because there are six of them, so I guess we want to know what we can work with, which ones are adequate, and which ones need to be... Okay. Um, the town planner says that she will work with you on that so okay. that you are completely aware so that you are not investing any money into something that we would say is, is fine out of the six plans. Okay. And I think I'm, I'm a little confused about whether we were applying or asking for an amended site plan because we're only proposing a change of use in the one building, does that mean that we have to meet all the requirements of the BA as if this was new construction with the facade and all of the buildings that are being used on the site? Would you like to handle that one too? Sure. You, you, yes, you have to meet all the standards. Obviously, some standards won't be applicable for existing conditions. Okay. So, you know, it, we don't have, for example, in the BA district, we don't have a standard that says you have a build to line, you have to be set back a certain number of feet from the road and no further because you have existing buildings. So we're not going to make you pick buildings up and move them to a build to line. So yes, you have to meet the standards as much as they appropriately apply to you. Okay. Of all of the existing buildings. Well, this is, the, this is really the issue. Is it a whole site plan or is it an amendment? Well, that's what I guess we should take your recommendation on that. Because and, and we aren't, at, we're not planning to change any of the buildings. It's, it's, it's your call. And you need to make a decision and go with it. <laughs> All right, thank All right. you. Well, at this time then, yes. Right. Like one other comment, and in terms of specifically what 
I know that we're doing a site plan for the whole project, and so we have to be able to confirm it. But particularly um, in terms of the new use on the property, the restaurant, mm -hmm. I think that we need to see the same kind of design drawings and layout of the landscaping and the outdoor seating areas and the parking areas um, strictly in compliance with everything that is new because this is a completely new use for the property and I think it needs to comply with all of the um, landscaping and facade type details that new construction would because it is a complete repurposing of that portion of mm -hmm. the facility. So at least as, as to that part, we would want to see. So yes, the, uh, the walkway. The parking, the landscaping the parking detail. Has already been, the parking is to the BA standard for all uses. Although it says in here that it is pedestrian. We have been for all for Nick's business and for the restaurant, according to the parking standards in the BA. Then perhaps it just needs to be depicted in a way that we can understand that you have all that detail here, because I can't pull that out of. You can't see that in this drawing, because you should have this drawing. I feel like fairly accurately depicted here. There are 37 spaces. Two of which are handicapped, 16 for retail, 12 for the restaurant, and 6 for Nick's business. So we're, we actually have three more than required. Okay, I guess I would leave that to the discretion of the town planner. All I want to say to you is that, particularly for the restaurant use, we're going to be looking for the same level of detail as we would were this new construction, because you had asked about, do we have to look at this as though it was new construction? For the most part, for the restaurant part of it. But we're not changing the exterior of the building. I'll, I'll, I will leave that to Maureen, okay? Because okay. that was my understanding, <clears throat> that if we weren't making exterior changes to the building. As it was explained in the workshop, you actually are making some exterior changes and you're adding the exterior seating and so we want to see the seating, both interior and exterior. Okay. The seating is here as well. But, I guess but in, if there is interior seating, if you're putting in... So you want a plan of the interior of the restaurant the as restaurant. well, yeah. is what you're asking for? Like, There's a lot that we're actually asking for, and okay. at this point I believe we had at least four people did say this was deemed incomplete. and. Okay. Um, it would probably be best to work with the town planner on, on how to revise the plans right. and what we're looking for. And Liza? Yeah, oh, and I just wanted to say um, Rudy's is the most recent restaurant yeah. application that we reviewed, and that was really detailed, and that might be helpful to look at. And was that a, an engineer or landscape architect? Landscape oh. Okay. All right. Just trying to save you with the engineer, because a landscape architect did a lot of that work. Okay. I guess I just didn't realize that we were having to, since we're not creating a ground up project here, we're taking a small space in an existing building and changing the use, that we would need the same level of detail that a building that was being constructed from the ground up would require. But it sounds like that's what you're expecting from us. I just want to be clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So at this point, though, we do need to formalize it with a vote. Would anyone like to make a motion on completeness? I'll make a motion. Uh, motion for the board to consider a motion for completeness. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Nick Tamaro and Jennifer Feeney for site plan review of a multi-use complex, including a, t a new 26-seat restaurant, the Summer Oven, located at 539 to 541 Ocean House Road be deemed incomplete. Do I have a second? Sure. Thank you, Joe. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? And this is, was that unanimous down here? I didn't see. Did you get that? 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Please, you Maureen will. will help you because it. We love. I love your vision. So, I love your vision, and I. I like where you're going with this. So I hope that we can get this moving. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, we should table this too. It's not. Nope. No, we if don't. You, it's incomplete. We don't even have it. Okay. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the well, a 44-seat restaurant site plan, and the Jordan Farm Stand site plan amendment. Jason Williams is requesting site plan review of the well at Jordan Farm, a 44-seat restaurant located at 21 Wells Road, and an amendment to the site plan for the Jordan Farm Stand. This will be reviewed under section 19-9, site plan review and completeness. Carol Ann. Carol Ann. Recuse myself from uh, hearing this item as I am one of the owners of Jordan's Farm. Thank you. Okay. Maureen. Okay. The well is located at 21 Wells Road, and that's in the RB district still. And um, the restaurant is classified as an agriculture related use. Um, that's a use that's allowed where the principal use on the property is agriculture, and you can. Um, put other uses on the property as long as they are subordinate to the principal use of agriculture and they're related to agriculture. Uh, however, the ordinance does say that if you put a structure on a property, a non-residential structure, and it's going to be there for more than 90 days, it needs to obtain site plan review. So while a lot of the structure that you're reviewing is already there, this is a brand new site plan for the well. Um, in addition, the, the proposal for the well is um, using and sharing parking from the Jordan Farm Stand. There is already on file an approval for the Jordan Farm Stand, so this approval would also include concurrently an amendment to the Jordan Farm Stand site plan for whatever changes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. You may proceed. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, my name is Todd Gammon. I'm a civil engineer with Blaze Civil Engineers. I'm here tonight to represent the Well Restaurant for the site plan application at 21 Wells Road. I have the aerial photo to give you guys some bearings on where we're at, intersection of Spurwink and Wells. It's the Jordan family farm. Also with me tonight are Penny Jordan, one of the property owners, and Jen Mowers is a manager with the Well Restaurant. Unfortunately, Jason Williams, the owner and applicant, couldn't make it tonight. He had an obligation out in Colorado, and uh, he will definitely be at the May meeting. Um, he actually wanted to convey me to convey to you that he quite enjoyed the workshop that he presented to you all, um, and I got the notes, and he conveyed a lot of the input that we got. Hopefully, we've uh, incorporated a lot of that into the application tonight. We have the number 21. Wells Road is the Jordan family home, the barn. Here is the farm stand. And this right here is the, the well restaurant to give you some bearings on the farm. The 
the some of the site elements that I want to speak tonight about. This up. It's it's actually it's a very unique project. Um, the well site plan is going to incorporate, as Maureen mentioned, it, it's actual simultaneous amendment of the farm stand application because we're going to be sharing some parking. We have the farm stand here. We've allocated some parking in these areas, which are 16 spaces. 11 will be for the well restaurant. Five will go with the the farm stand that was originally approved in. Uh, in 2000 with their site plan application. Um, a, a few of the details in the application, the site elements, we have a wooden bridge, we have a 20 by 8 um, mobile restaurant. It actually is on wheels. It's going to be a seasonal restaurant. It's going to be open for five months. It's going to serve one meal. It's going to be open from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. It has an attached porch. It has four gazebos three picnic tables. We're going to be adding one more wooden bridge and it's also going to have a fire pit, pit and a composting toilet system. Um, we are going to have a subsurface water system and some underground electric associated and also a storage unit for the restaurant itself. Um, it is a fully functioning kitchen uh, with a two types of stove units. It has a couple of propane tanks in the rear um, the whole intention of the restaurant is to have the lightest footprint as possible on the Jordan's uh, property itself. It has been around for three or four years. The first year, I believe Jason told me it was open for six weeks. They didn't quite know what it was at the time. And over, I think they actually moved the, the mobile trailer around. And we're at a point now where it's, it's gained enough momentum and marketing and and clientele we're, we're presenting here tonight for, for an official site plan application. So he's very excited about that. Um, one of the other major aspects of the project I'll bring up is, is really the partnership between the Jordan family and the Well Restaurant. Um, the items that he sells in the restaurant are actually picked or purchased at the farm stand daily and they're incorporated into the meals. It is the ultimate in um, farm to table in terms of operational um, dynamics. It's, uh, it's quite unique in, in Maine and New England. Um, as I spoke with Penny Jordan last week about uh, some of the implications for the farm stand and, and the family's quite, quite excited in terms of the financial viability the uh, stability that it, that it offers, the marketing, they have shared parking, they have shared clientele, um, they have, uh, it, it truly is a, a partnership where they're, you know, picking the vegetables from the farm fields and incorporating into the, the meals that Jason's serving. So it is quite unique. It's not a year-round restaurant. It's not set up to be that. It will be just five months in seasonal. Um, we feel that we've met all the site plan standards accordingly though, regardless of the seasonal mo mobile application. Um, the memo that was provided to the board, um, a couple of things on the summary of completeness. I do have an updated, uh, I just, I wanted to make one change. It says the applicant has provided a verbal assessment of the wetlands. We did get a a written letter uh, from statewide surveys and what I wanted was to make sure that the um, some of the wetter areas down adjacent to the employee parking which is shown here off to the right there is an, an existing access drive that comes off the farm field We've allocated six parking spaces for employees that walk up to the restaurant here any of the patrons to the restaurant will park out in front of the near the farm stand. Um, the wetland survey was done in this area closer to Spurwink. Um, the written letter was provided. I actually did get an updated one to prove to, we just it's an RP2 wetland, so we just wanted to make sure that we were not disturbing any of the wetlands. He's provided an updated one that I have tonight, and we're about 100 feet from 
the wetlands line in that area, and he's actually staked that and flagged it. Um, that's, that's one thing on the completeness. The second one was uh, we have provided the, the ability to serve letter request to the Portland Water District, and obviously it's been in use for a number of years. We don't expect that there's going to be any volume or pressure issue, and we're waiting for a response from the PWD on that. Um, in terms of the AMEC letter, I think most of the, we were pretty happy with the, the minor comments. Um, we're aware that there's going to need to be a street opening permit for the back employee parking lot. That'll be an after the fact permit um, for that drive entrance that Bob Malley pointed out. Um, Steve Harding also pointed out the trying to understand some of the separation of the grass and gravel in the parking areas. All of this is gravel in the, in the farm stand area in this area. What I've called out as grass is really a grass gravelly area. It's mostly gravel with some grass coming up through. It's pretty stable um, gravel bed. There's no intention to go through and upgrade any of the gravels. Um, along the restaurant itself, we're going to have a, th a four foot wide stone dust on gravel area just for access, pedestrian access to walk around. All the, the parking stalls will have wheel mounts to provide separation so that people know exactly where to go. It's a little more haphazard today in terms of the, um, how people come in and park. So there's going to be a lot more refinement in terms of the siting of everything and coordination with the farm stand. Um, I think of some other elements. The other notes on here, he mentioned the space in bulk. We do have 16 parking spaces, as I mentioned, 11. 11 will go with the well restaurant, five will go with the original, with the farm stand, which was part of their original permit in 2000. The 11 parking spaces comes from the zoning ordinance requirement of one space per four seats. This is a 44 seat restaurant, therefore we've given 11. Um, the, the 44 seats are broken out into the four gazebos, the three picnic tables, and there's also an inner porch area off the well, the 20 by 8 trailer, uh, where four people can sit for the total of 44. And he has six employees, so we need 11 spaces for the, any clientele, and we need six for the employees. So we have a total of 22 on site that we've, we've shown. Um, the next comment is on the letter. I have the updated letter. There's no wetlands concerns. And then he's also mentioned that he'd like a 10-foot paved apron uh, per the town standard for town ways in the back employee parking area in this area. So we will pave that. That's a, that's a minor design change on the, on the detail. Um, for clarification on items number four and five, when, yep. you, were, when you were talking um, about uh, the parking space, there, it will be gravel. Um, I believe they were saying a note should be added, so you will be adding a note? We can add a note. It's most, I think he was thinking, I actually spoke with him about it, he was thinking it was a lush grass area. It's basically a giant gravel area with some grass growing through it, so it's actually quite stable. There's no issue with so, okay, any so stability be, concern. I'll actually so. redefine that on the existing condition. Okay, and same with uh, number five, space and bulk regulations. Mm -hmm. um, he's saying, um, should also include information on the plan. Yeah. And you will be including that information on the plan. I will be. I actually, you can see the, I've got the space and bulk table in this area on the plans. Um, and I just called out for 22 uh, parking spaces. He just wanted me to denote the fact that 16, 17 were with yes. the well and five were with the farm stand. That's easy enough to do. I'll do that okay. in that table. Yeah. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you. Can you clarify that? I still have one question about the parking. You talk about a shared parking. Are there fewer spaces than if these were separate? Does it? No. Uh, no. no. So there are as many parking spaces as would be needed. We're not having any fewer spaces because right. it's shared the parking. The only thing that they're sharing is that they're near each other. Okay. So it's a, actually, he's, he's calculated out for five spaces for the farm stand, plus 11 for customers, plus six for restaurant employees. So it's, there's no proposal that um, a space would be occupied by two different uses. Okay. Thank you. 
I have a question. Yes. Is the 10-foot-long um, apron required at both the employee entrance and the main entrance to the farm stand? The main entrance currently has one. Okay. So they've called the only attention to the back employee one. Okay. Any other questions around completeness? No? Okay. I'm going to open this to uh, public comment then. Does anyone from the public like to comment on whether or not these plans are complete? And seeing no one, I will bring this back to the board then. And we no um, questions on completeness. Then we can take a, a motion at this time on completeness. If someone like to make a motion, I'll make a motion. Thank you, Lane. Motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Jason Williams for site plan review of the well, a 44-seat restaurant located at 21 Wells Road, and an amendment to the Jordan Farm Stand site plan approval be deemed complete. Do I have a second? Henry, thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor of completeness? Okay, thank you. All right. Now, at this point, does the board have any questions? Sorry. Oh, uh, yes. Well, actually, I do have a question. I had a question in regards to Chapter 11. This came up in the, um, uh, when we were talking earlier, about health and sanitation. And it says, any food establishment with a uh, seating capacity of 30 or more shall provide separate lavatories and toilets for males and females. Mm -hmm. Does your plan call for separate lavatories? Um, we were hoping to do one composting toilet system. I did talk to Ben about that. Um, we were trying to figure out in the code whether, since the farm stand has a porta potty with the sink, and they have two during the year. And if we put in one, whether that would count as two. And he said, as long as you have two toilets and two, and they each have a sink, we'd be happy to put in two if we had to. So right now, it is a it's a composting um, self-contained unit. Uh, we're showing it's a, it's going to be in a wooden um, type structure. We could put a second one in if we had to. <clears throat> That's what uh, Chapter 11 calls mm -hmm. for, and I guess I'm going to have to defer that, uh, refer that to Ben, or I'm not I, sure. I, I, what I would suggest the board do is um, make sure you've communicated what your thoughts are to the applicant, and I know the applicant is working with the code officer, and that the applicant needs to come back at, for next month's meeting with an answer, definitive yep. answer to this question. Then does the board have any comments on what was proposed versus uh, what Chapter 11 says, that there shall be provided separate laboratory and toilets for males and females. I guess I have a question. I mean, is this um, a delicate way of putting it? Are, are temporary toilets part of, allowed as part of that, like the mobile toilets, or does it have to be a permanent toilet that's attached to a sewage system or a composting system. Is there any rules or regulations on that? But I guess it's a bit more in the question. Well, and I'm not the expert on it, but I know that Ben, our code officer, has been working on this. And um, I don't think you've landed yet. I know there's been a lot of exchange back and forth. I do know that um, the code officer has made clear that it's not just a toilet. You also have to have a lavatory. So um, I, I would like to suggest that we let the code officer and the applicant try to find a solution before next meeting. This might say the laboratory being a wash basin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lane. And just to clarify, there's no requirement that it actually be hooked up to the sewer system. This is more a debate right now of can, do we need one or are we going to need two? Can I do some sort of shared um, situation with the farm stand? Uh, and we're going to work with Ben on that and, and determine what exactly that regulation states. So Elaine, and then I'll go back to Peter. I guess my question about this is we generally don't make specific findings or recommendations about building code requirements, things that aren't specific site plan criteria. So it, it seems to me that anything we approve has to comply with all 
code requirements and that to call this one out separately in fact might suggest that some others we're not concerned about it just it seems to me that this isn't I think it's appropriate to bring it up because it's there but it, it seems to be not necessarily something which would be appropriate for us for a finding but maybe that's in this sense, because I, I, you know in the past when you veered into the whole building code thing, I usually encourage you to veer right back out again. Um, but <laughs> in this case, because um, you've got every single building has got its own little footprint. Mm -hmm. If for some reason the conclusion that the code officer comes to is you need to have two composting toilets and the little square on the site plan has to be twice the size that it is now, that would be considered a site plan amendment. The applicant would have to come back and it would be unfortunate to do that after you had just approved it. So to the extent it changes the site plan in an area where you have jurisdiction, you do need to know that. Um, to the extent that you, the board decides that something meets chapter 11, I would say that's really the code officer's um, requirement. He has to decide that it meets Chapter 11. I've had a couple of conversations with him. I've indicated to him that I'm looking forward to him sending a memo to the board at some point that says this is what he thinks <coughs> his decision is. So it's more an informational. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yes. I mean, okay. in order yeah. to get a final site plan approval, you're going to have to resolve that issue. Yeah one way or the other. No, you make a good point. It's, it's really not. The code issue isn't a debatable item for us. Once he gives us clarification on exactly what he needs, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Peter, I saw, and then I'll go. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I have no problem in principle since the two operations, the farm stand and the restaurant, are so closely integrated <clears throat> because their common hours of operation overlap for just a very small period of time that I wouldn't have any problem using the farm stands facility as qualifying for part of the requirement with respect to the uh, restaurant. And Which I'm, I'm still going to wait for the that, referral. That's one option we're putting yeah, in, just I, so you I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, and I'll be just looking for a letter from the code enforcement officer. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, we do have an approval standard, though, that mm -hmm. um, is concerned with sewage. So mm -hmm. we would be looking at that, I would be. And this says, if the public system cannot serve or be extended to serve a new or expanded use, the sewage shall be disposed of by an on-site sewage disposal system meeting the requirements of the state wastewater disposal rules in Chapter 15, Article 2, Private Sewage Disposal Ordinance. So mm -hmm. I would just be looking for something that says that whatever you come up with. Yep. But would that apply also to the water coming out of the sink? What, like, I'd be curious to know what you're planning on doing with that. Um. Well, we've got two options. Right now, we've, we are showing the, a subsurface water line that yeah. feeds the restaurant itself just in the sink, and there's a gray water tank that that goes into, and that is pumped by a waste hauler. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. So, that, yes, I mean, the water, he actually, there's such little amount of water used for the restaurant. I mean, he could probably sell bottled water and, and do a different system. I was actually talking to Troyano Waste Systems about that. Um, to get more detailed, the porta potty that they have, they call a country classic. There's actually a water, they fill the water with fresh water every day and they use a, f a foot pump. So they not only come in and take out the waste, but they actually install, have water in a tank now, 30 gallons, so that you can have both. So there's actually a sink and a toilet in the porta potty, which meets the code. And then we would be putting one also for the well. But yes, there is a, we're looking at both water and waste. And everything will be above board in terms of how it's discharged with a waste hauler and, and the amounts and whatnot. So, anyone else? Um, I have a final comment. I believe that the parking in the uh, the front, those five spots, mm -hmm. or however many they are, total seven. Place. There we go. Yes. I believe um, under uh, the parking standards, it says um, no parking space shall be located within five feet of the front property line. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't tell from the drawings if those are back five feet. Yeah, I actually, I did get that email. Right now, the ones on the front, actually you're right, the, the, it is five, there. it's probably like three feet. So I got that email, we're going to push that back two feet. Okay, thank uh, yeah, you. Just to, make sure that we're in compliance with the five-foot 
from the property line. I have one more question. Is yes. the um, route from the parking area all the way past the restaurant to the uh, porta potty in the back, would that be ADA accessible? And uh, so the, all the bridges would have the proper slope? It actually, I actually had some conversation with him. It, it is now. He has the, the bridge and he has the ramps and the restaurant. Everything's pretty flat out there in terms of the, the uh, most of it is like a wood chip surface. Right now we're going to upgrade that to gravel and a stone dust so it would be a little easier to navigate. Um, but to answer your question, for the yes, I mean the bridges, the flatness of the site out to the back, everything's going to have certain, I can look further at those slopes, but the intent is to have ADA. We've got the van accessible spot in front with the signage. Um, so yes, we've looked at that as well. Would anyone like to take a site walk? Okay, I'm seeing that. Then would um, anyone like to um, set a public hearing, make a motion for a public hearing for next month? I can do that. Oh, what well, motion? Have you done the completeness? No, I've lost you it. You did. You're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Then we won't be taking the site walk. Then we will be um, seeing you on May 22nd. Would you like to make that motion? Yeah, Joe's going to make it. Okay, thanks, Joe. Hmm? Motion. Oh, motion to table. <laughs> be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Jason Williams for site plan review of the well, a 44 seat restaurant located at 21 Wells Road, and an amendment to the Jordan Farm stand site plan approval be tabled to the regular May 22nd, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. And do I hear a second? Thank you, Liza. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. We'll see you on May 22nd. Thanks. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the Harvest Lane Private Road Amendment. Nick and Jim Tamaro are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Harvest Lane Private Road to provide access and frontage to a new lot located at the end and southerly of Harvest Lane. This will be reviewed under Section 19-7-9, Private Road Standards, and we will be discussing first completeness. Uh, Maureen, do you have a... Sure. Um, Harvest Lane is located in the uh, Residence Aid District. The minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet. Uh, a few years ago, the Planning Board approved Harvest Lane as a private road and provided access, and it provides frontage for um, Nick Tamaro's lot, which is on the east side of Harvest Lane. And um, at the time, the Board had granted waivers for the construction of Harvest Lane so that it functionally looks like a private access way, but it was approved as a private road. Um, the applicant is now proposing to add an additional lot for access to Harvest Lane. Um, I should point out that uh, the board may want to provide the, the applicant with direction tonight regarding um, their feelings on waivers from the standards of the private road standards, specifically the 22 foot wide travel road surface. Great. Okay. You may begin again. Thank you again, Todd Gammon, Blaze Civil Engineers. Uh, I'm here tonight with Nick Tamro and his dad, Jim, to 
talk about the proposed private road amendment for Harvest Lane. I've got an aerial photo to give you some bearings again. Um, it's off Spurwink Avenue, uh, Pleasant, I believe it's Ridge. Um, it's finally an extension here of Daw Road at the intersection of Daw and Valley Road. Harvest Lane is here. Um, in this area, this is Nick Camero's house, number two, Harvest Lane. As Maureen mentioned, in 2009, they did a, um, built a road to private access way standards. It was 14 feet wide. It's a 40 foot right of way. What we're hoping to do tonight is get completeness to provide for a second lot. It's about two and a half acres. Provide the necessary frontage and extend the right of way for his dad to build a home. And this will be the second and final lot in this area. Um, they're purchasing the land from the Maxwells. Um, we're proposing tonight to add an emergency turnaround that meets the turnaround standards for the town. We're, going, we're proposing to widen the existing 14-foot gravel harvest lane to 18 feet and also provide the necessary right of way to get the 125 feet of front, frontage required for the, uh, the house lot. Also for this, we're going to have a, a new proposed water service. Due to the distance, we're going to need a water meter pit. Uh, also, underground electric cable phone conduits installed for the new house lot. Second sh on the second sheet in the set, we have the overall boundary survey of what will be carved out of the parcel. This is, the, this is Nick Tamro's lot here. This will be the lot that will be carved out. The survey in wetlands was done by statewide survey. We have a letter and the wetlands were flagged. Um, we're showing, to give you an idea, with the drive extension and the potential house location, septic and garage, although the the private road amendment only applies to a 50-foot jut out of the road extension in this area um, across from where Nick currently has a turnaround that's going to be built to the town standard. This is a blow-up plan of the proposal, which would be an expansion of the existing paved apron at the entrance to 18 feet, the rest of the gravel way. There's a 100-foot section here that was a paper street that abutting properties have act, um, rights to. And then we get onto Nick's property and we're gonna extend it to the left, go out 40 feet, it'll be 24 foot wide. It's really a minimal amount of gravel. We're gonna have a cross culvert. I did a little drainage analysis to size the pipe. Um, and we've shown the right of way necessary to get the 125 foot, front, foot frontage for the amendment. The, the key, I guess, tonight in terms of the waivers that Maureen mentioned, since this isn't a raw piece of land and it's not a brand new project, um, the applicant is hoping to keep more of a rustic appeal for the neighborhood. In 2009, the original lot was built to the private access way standard of 14 feet of gravel, two foot grass on gravel shoulders for a total 18 feet wide, side ditches right and left, um, it does convey some flow from the town, stormwater from Valley. There's a catch basin in the right of way also. Um, there's a 10 foot paved apron. And the hope was because there's an existing road there and there are technical considerations in terms of widening to the 22 feet private road standard, we're hoping to get a waiver to only increase the width from 14 to 18 and not 22 because of the fact that you have the adjacent drainage ditches, you have the catch base, and you have the stormwater flow. We want to limit the impact on any abutting neighbors as, most, as best we can. And also there was a requirement to pave this portion of the right of way, just the 40 foot stub out, 24 by feet wide by 40 feet. Everything in here is currently gravel. So it would stand out to just have that paved portion because the driveway itself up to the house from here is going to all be gravel. So the hope was there's four waivers being asked. Number one was the curbing at the entrance. 
Number two was the requirement of 50 feet of pavement from Valley Road. Number three was a waiver down from a 22 foot width requirement to 18. And the fourth one was to not pave this turnaround um, that we'd like to hear your thoughts on. Those are the main considerations. I have talked to Bob Malley. He does understand that there are some technical considerations there to be had. Um, I went out and took some width measurements. I think we can easily get 18 feet. Um, 22 feet would be a little, quite a bit more of a technical challenge. And the hope is that there's only going to be two lots. These are the only two that can be developed. Nick has his portion. His dad's lot will abut, directly abut um, his lot. There's no easements or access ways through there. This will be only two lots and they're hoping to keep a majority of it gravel as it is today. And limiting, limiting the width will help immensely since all the improvements and drainage have been done from five years ago. And as I mentioned, the, the wetlands analysis was done. There's not going to be any, it's an RP2 wetland, there's no disturbance. In any of the wetlands, um, we're able to navigate the driveway up to the house location. We've had a full septic suitability study done. Um, a number of augers and Dick Sweet stamped off on the fact that um, we can have a septic system up there in the house location. We found an upland area for the house and the garage and um, the driveway to access. So we feel that we've, we've met all the standards. We actually followed the minor subdivision checklist and standards in this approval. <clears throat> I guess I'll take any questions. If okay. I, I have a question. Um, it's uh, whether or not to go with um, what the engineer is asking for, keeping to the standards of 23 feet. But does that go into completeness? So do we go through the AMAC lid or is that going to get into substantial review? Typically, you make a distinction between complete and adequate. So um, an applicant could provide you information about a road and you could deem it complete because they showed you the road, they showed you what they wanted to do, and then still decide that it's what they have shown you is not adequate to meet the standards. Okay, so we're going to discuss completeness and without getting into the standard at this point. So then I would ask Elaine a question. Can you use the microphone, please? Yes. Um, I understand what you're saying, Maureen, but my strong inclination is to say that we really need to comply with the 22-foot road standard. I seem to recall when this was initially approved in the way that it was. It was on the representation that there was only going to be one lot. There was only ever going to be one lot. So it was going to be one person back there. And therefore, we approved basically a private access way, although that wasn't what it was called. And now those original representations are being changed. So the fact that it's an existing condition to me is not very persuasive because that existing condition was allowed to be created based on representations that are now being changed. So I actually don't think this application is sufficiently complete to show us what all the ramifications of a 22-foot wide road would be. Um, I can't tell, I don't have enough to say whether 22 feet is, is doable or not doable, what is the impact on the road would be. So to me, in this case, it actually is not complete because what I think is required here is not shown. To uh, follow up on that comment, I, I know you were just here five years ago, so I pulled the meeting minutes. And when you first came in for completeness review, you were asking for 14 private access way standards. And you were requesting the waiver, and this is from the minutes from February 23, 2009. He's requesting a waiver from private road standards because there are no plans for future development of this parcel of land. And then when you came back on March 17th of that year to discuss this, um, you noted that um, here we go. We had public comment at the public hearing, and the comments were trying to um, 
were in such a manner that they were saying the first person that spoke said that um, the applicant wanted to create a farmstead and this would serve the whole community. So there was this farmstead, so just his home and everything else that goes with the farm. And another person got up and spoke and said um, he was he feels it is inspiring to see a young resident willing to commit to creating a new working farm on the Maxwell property. And he wants the town to do more to encourage this type of development. So when I went back to the meeting minutes, I would have to say I, I agree with Elaine, who was on the board at that time, and there was another member sitting here that was on the board. That's the impression I'm getting from reading the minutes, is that it was a welcome change because this was going to be a farmstead, a working farm by subdividing it you're getting away from the working farm and I am also starting I do believe that we should look at 22 feet and I'm wondering that's why I asked Maureen if this would be the time to talk about the standards because um, if I want to see 22 and if there's other members that want to see 22 I wasn't sure if then if it's complete mm -hmm. but does anyone else have now that we're talking about the size of the road, the width of the road. Does anyone else have any comments on the width of the road? Yes. I'll go on the record as saying um, I think it's, uh, the request to go to 18 feet is reasonable. Thank you. Anyone else? Could you clarify, uh, Victoria, the, the section of road that we're talking about now is just that cutout on the new parcel? Um, maybe you could help me a little on. Well, they're they're adding to the they're adding to the road, so you get to look at the whole road. And, and, and excuse me. You have the the distance from Valley Road in. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the Tamaro property to the right, the new parcel to the left, and are, are we really concerned about the? coming up the existing road and then hanging the left and going through that cutout and out into the new parcel? Yeah, the, the one part you wouldn't be looking at is um, the part that goes down towards the driveway to Nick's house is, is not really part of your review, but you would be looking at the portion of the private road from Valley Road right. where the public works director is saying he wants curbing added and he wants the first 50 feet paved. And then as you go up Harvest Lane, um, that road is 14 feet of traveled way plus two feet of loam and seated shoulder, so it's got 18 foot gravel base, and that's where there's a discussion about taking that to 22 feet. Yep. And then when you get past um, past the houses, the lots on either side, and you hang a left, you the left I believe goes about 50 feet, and that first 50 feet is what you would have uh, also to review, and beyond that you would stop. Uh, the one other thing I would offer the board is I believe that the applicant suggested that there will be a section in that last 50 feet that they would be required to pave. And I would suggest that I don't consider that last 50 feet the turnaround. I consider the area across from it the turnaround so that there is a turnaround already and that you don't need to treat that 50 foot leg as a turnaround. Does that make sense? Well, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but everything until you got to the last point it's because the second lot has been opened up but now serving two lots has to meet the the road requirement so the 22 feet should now go from valley road up to the property line for the new parcel yes okay and up, then it's, and, then it's and, a driveway and there. the first 50 feet into the new parcel uh, because because that's also part of the private road why would that just be the end of the driveway um, it's part of the private road because that's how you're creating frontage uh, for that second lot that's just been created oh, okay yeah okay. yeah so literally there'll be about 40 feet of gravel yeah. 24 yeah. feet wide is the only bump out to the left in them I'm actually showing you a photo here standing on Valley Road so you guys can see exactly what the, uh, the existing gravel road looks like. Um, what, we're, what we'd highly encourage is we're hoping to get completeness tonight. If you would not going to approve the waiver 
of the paving for the first 50 feet and the curbing, I did want to show that this 14 foot, and then they did two feet grass on gravel, so there's 18 feet wide now. You can see that, that I could, we could go to the 22 feet. It's not technically impossible. We just wanted to limit the amount of disturbance to the area and ask for the waiver. We're hoping that the whole application itself is complete. Going to 22 feet can be shown in the detail. Paving the 50 feet can be shown, and obviously we can add the curbing if we have to. So the, the first thought was to ask for the waiver if we could to keep the existing nature of the neighborhood feel the same. If we can't get the waivers, we feel that the package is complete and that they're pretty minor detail changes on some of the details to incorporate to get us to the next meeting. Are those drainage swales on either side of the... Uh, Are they... Drainage swales? Yes. Okay. Yep, right and left. Vegetated. Any other comments? I, I think we could deem it complete, even though we... Some of us, some people are disinclined to grant the waiver. I, I see them as two separate issues. I am willing at this point, um, based on a comment Maureen made, that we can still deem it complete, and then we can have that discussion on okay. uh, the width. Okay. If anyone else has any comments about completeness? Yeah, that's true. Before we get there, before we take our vote, um, I am looking for any public comment. Would anyone like to make any comments around completeness? We have enough information in front of us to review this. And then you'll get a, a chance to also discuss anything beyond completeness, whether or not we have enough information in front of us. Okay, then I'm going to close that part on completeness. And we'll have a second opportunity to speak. At uh, this time, I'll take a motion on completeness. Thank you, Eliza. I'll make a motion. Motion for the board to consider. Motion for complete, completeness. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Nick Tamaro for an amendment to the previously approved Harvest Lane private road to extend the road to provide adequate frontage for a second lot be deemed complete. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Um, I heard Joe Galotis. I'll go with Joe. Okay, any comments on the motion? Then everyone uh, who's in favor of completeness? Okay, and opposed? Thank you, Elaine. Okay, it's been deemed complete, so now we can get into our discussion about the road. Um, we do have somebody that would like to speak at, at this point. With, I'd like to open back up to the public and then the board can begin their discussion. Okay, I'd like to open this up at this time. Anyone would like to come forward to speak on this item? And just remember to state your name and your address, please, for the record. My name is Byron Castro. I live at 185 Fowler Road, but I also own the house that was shown in the last picture on 29 Valley Road. Um, it's a home that we plan to keep and probably move back at some, at some point. I did take some uh, uh, pictures of Valley Road and stuff. I don't know if, I only made a few copies. I didn't know how many was supposed to, <laughs> supposed to make, but we could share a couple. Do you have one um, more, Brian? Brian? Are we? Sorry, he's fine. Okay. I, I think I might have another one or something. I think I, I got another one or a page of one or so. Um, I need this one. <laughs> Do you have a copy for yourself? Or? I'll use this one. Okay. If I can. Okay. Um, my first and foremost thing I want to say is that I'm glad to see that Nick's parents are the ones who are going to be moving behind us. I have some real concerns, though, um, by looking at this plan. Um, as you could see in the picture as before, it does have a rule characteristic, and that uh, the fact you could also see our garage was in the corner of that. 
Um, if you look at some of these roads on the first page of that, you're going to find that a lot of these houses, even after they were built, don't even meet the requirements needed for frontage as it is. If you look at some of the circle houses, they have frontages of 56, 75. Um, those are in a different district, obviously, but um, they're supposed to have at least 100 feet, and there's a lot of them in the circle that don't have that much frontage. Um, so it's not uncharacteristic to be in that neighborhood to show that, that you don't really need to have a lot of uh, frontage on the road uh, to build houses. You also, if you look down Ridge Road on the second page, you'll notice that uh, there's also two houses sharing a uh, driveway down there. Um, they also um, don't have a lot of house frontage. Uh, if you look on a few more houses on Ridge Road, you'll also see the frontage just doesn't meet requirements. Uh, my biggest concern is on Harvest Lane is making it more um, like a highway, I guess, because it's really going to affect our house that we live there now. Um, i got to go through my notes if you bear with me. i got to get my glasses. I can't see a thing. I'm sorry. Um, that when, we, when Nick built, this, built the farm, we were glad to see it, but it... It did hinder us a little bit. It did change our property setbacks from, uh, from Harvest Lane. It changed it from uh, 10 feet to 20 feet, so it made our garage a non-conforming building, which we were, we were understandable. We took it in stride and stuff like that. My biggest concern is if you make Harvest Lane be turned to the behind our house, it's going to reduce those, our back setbacks again from 15 feet to 20 feet. Um, my personal opinion is if, if we're going to have a house back there and the Tamaros want to be there, that I'd rather see no confinements. In other words, reduce the turnaround altogether and just make a driveway there. Um, it really is going to put a big factor on our house, and I'm not sure if I, I, the number is on there, 52, 54, and 56. I'm not sure how close those the driveway would be, but I mean, if they were... if Nick was willing to be able to move that driveway down a little bit further and give us a little bit more buffer and change the setback rules. I mean, I, I can't see not just having a driveway there. If this building is going to be built, um, I want it to be as less impact on, I think, us, and I think I, as Nick is trying to do, is try to make less impact on, on the property owners itself. If you move that curbing, as you saw on, on Daw Road, or what's now is Harvest Lane, if you do curbings or stuff there, it's going to really impact number 48 and myself, I'm number 50, um, by just creating a, a hardship, I think it's going to be in both cases. I really do not like want to see the road extended to the left, again, it, it impacts me, but I do not want to hold up a plan because of frontage. I mean, like I said, if you look at a lot of these houses in this neighborhood, it is a dead-end road. This will be, have to be the last house. There's no other house that can go any further on this, this area, or we're going to end up in a broad cove system type of, type of situation where you just keep pounding, trying to shove houses in a, in a small residential area. It just isn't going to feed you. You're, you're going to have problems. So, um, you know, my thing is, if we're going to build this house, let's try not to do it so much impact on on myself as well as other neighbors. Um, I personally, again, I, I, I really like the ruleness of, of what it has. We have welcomed uh, the, the farm behind us. Um, you know, my wife loves visiting the cows when she gets. Uh, but I really, really, really are stressing, if you're gonna, gonna go through with this, please allow it to be a less impact as possible. Um, like you said, it, it really, really is a uh, nice neighborhood, um, and we're just, I'm just really trying to push that, you know, let's try to keep the impact down as much as possible as possible. And I think we can, I mean, as you can see in a lot of these properties, it's not uncommon in this neighborhood to have a small uh, road frontage and still have a house. I mean, so, uh, if you look at some of that second pages, I think some of those lots or even in the uh, uh, 20,000, there's one there, it's 20,000 square feet, it's in Valley Road Extension, as you can see. It only has 58 feet, so it isn't unheard of in this neighborhood. Okay. Um, 
if you bear Byron, with me. I, hate I just to want to make you sure. Off, but I always forget something along the line. I, I regret it when I don't. Do you want to wrap it up a little? Because yeah. I was supposed to give you three, and you've, you're a good talker. So. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's basically the nut and, and most of it. Thank you. Thank you. I won't steal his. Sorry. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to also speak? Okay. Then I'm going to bring this. I'm going to close this part, and I'm going to bring this back to the board. Um, we have started a discussion about whether or not to. Um, widen this to the town standards, um, including the curbing, the uh, paving, the 50 feet, and the other waivers that were requested. We've heard from two people on this, and I'd like to hear from the rest of the board, though, your thoughts on, yes. Um, it's a question for Maureen. Maureen, are there any setbacks for a private road? Um, there's the code officer applies setbacks for for roads. Yes. Okay. It's it's you end up having a, a road frontage setback as opposed to a side setback or a rear yard setback, but that is completely beyond your ability to change. Okay. You you don't get to deal with setbacks. The zoning board and the code officer does. Okay. So we can't say this private. Way code. beyond your authority. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I find myself leaning a little bit in favor of the rustic nature of the setting and wondering why the full width is necessarily required as long as there's only one additional parcel. Maureen, you indicated I think the staff was uh, had issues. Could you speak sort of for the staff on how you guys see this? This is pretty much a re one a rerun of, of the um, discussion you had on Elizabeth Road in Shore Acres. And that discussion is that staff does not support waivers. Uh, there are standards in the ordinance that uh, staff has worked hard on. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you all worked on the subdivision ordinance for a decent period of time. Town engineer, public works director, fire chief, they all worked on the technical standards section and they, they don't support the waivers. Uh, that doesn't mean that the planning board doesn't have the authority to grant them. But you, this is more just a consistency of, of town planning it, it's, on ways. It's not just a rigidity, though. I mean, yeah. we could sit each one of those guys here, and they would explain to you why curbing is, and, and they're very good at explaining why curbing is important, why paving the first 50 feet from the edge of the town road preserves the town's edge of pavement. Otherwise, you have that edge of pavement starting to break down, plus you have the spray of gravel going into the road. Uh, curbing is there to deal with drainage issues. And the width of the road, um, you know, that's the fire chief driving the ladder truck, uh, which is a big vehicle. And if you have 22 feet of a gravel base, then even in the winter when it snows and the, and the snow banks build up, you still have enough place to pass and go back and forth. Uh, they worry about, and, and you can hear them talk about it, if, if, if they are responding to an emergency at one site and then they get a, a second call. They need to be able to have their emergency vehicles pass each other um, on a road. So it, it is your call on how you want to handle this, but um, staff has thought long and hard about these standards and, and that's what they recommend. I just want to say, um, I was new to the planning board when this was um, passed, and I remember at the time, um, the main consideration was the neighbors um, abutting this paper street on either side and not building something that would be too intrusive. Um, so I think that consideration still stands here. Um, and I know now, also when people say, I don't plan on further developing it. Or we had a case today where somebody is subdividing our lot and saying, we have no plans to sell it. That's irrelevant as far as we're concerned. <laughs> we know, you know, so there, there can always be and might always be future development. Um, and we'll all die someday and someone else will own the land when that happens. 
So, um, but I do, I do feel like it's not great planning um, to have this road come right back around behind the Castro's house and to, 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 um, to, to bound their house in by road on three sides. And Maureen, is that, is that a consideration that we can take into account? There's, there's nothing that requires a road to be set back from a property line. Okay. And Again, when you think about it, you know, there's yep. no road setback from a property line. There's no driveway setback from a property line. Mm -hmm. um, you only control the property you own. And if you know, if this was a subdivision, you could look at buffering standards. Um, but it's really a private road review, borrowing appropriate standards out of the subdivision ordinance. Thank you. More, I have a question for Maureen. Uh, just in looking at this map, it looks like Daw Road is quite narrow. Would it act? Would it matter if the roads going to this point are less than the 22 feet? I mean, uh, would that be an argument for making the, the road again? Less it's than that? it's up to the board to make that decision. I I can tell you that you know. The standards for town roads were 24 feet at one point, then they get dropped down to 20 feet, then they go move, crawled back up a little bit to 22 feet. So um, the board has, has the authority to waive standards in the subdivision ordinance, and it's up to you to decide what you want to do with those. And clearly in the past, you have waived standards, and then more recently have chosen not to waive standards. So. Yes, I think that the less you waver on these types of things, the more even flow it is. I mean, you want to try and create a, an even playing field for people, not constantly, somebody changes it to this one, why can't you change it for me? I mean, are the overrides of this rural type road greater than the desire to keep it an open a, a, you know, playing field that, that, that is even? I mean, we've done that, changed it slightly over the water, uh, you know, the levels of where the water, where, where um, beach areas and water start, trying to make it a simple system rather than constantly diverting. So I would be in favor of not, reduce, of not allowing a, a smaller area and requiring the road to be, to be the standard that is set by the panel. Thank you, Henry. Carol Ann. I have a question. Is this lot subdividable with wetlands? Is there another buildable lot on this two and a half acres? I'm not sure. All right. And because of the, the amount of wetlands. Well, it's kind of big on the plan. <laughs> it's, well, you're just showing setbacks on the plan, so not showing the building envelope. And my concern is for the abutters um, and taking this road to 22 feet. Um, and once it gets beyond the abutters, it goes out to the standard road width, correct? 22 feet. Once we get beyond the abutting property, first... When it takes a, a left hand it's going the to turn, the, it goes to... It's going to the appropriate width. It goes 22, to 24 feet wide. 24 feet. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking travel way. That's my... Yeah. My well, point. I was actually going to bring something up that Maureen mentioned, which was you mentioned that you consider the emergency turnaround Nick's on Nick's side. If we don't consider the left turn and emergency turnaround, 22 feet. should we, can we narrow it below the 24 feet that I have now? I would, I would do that unless the board tells you otherwise. Which would, which would help Mr. Castro and talking about limiting behind his, I mean, we're open to limiting it as much as we can. Yes, um, is the remaining, Nick, is your remaining lot subdividable where your house is? 
No, my house lot is uh, 10,000 square feet more. I'm looking here. It looks like we've got a. Because you need an eighty. You need a hundred thousand. Yes. To to put it in context, I mean, the the lots that Tamaros are proposing don't have any potential for further subdivision. But right behind them is the seventy plus acres of the Maxwell Farm. So that's where the potential for further development is. And if if you can think of the Maxwell Farm. They have a lot of frontage on Spurwink Ave. They have a lot of frontage on Sawyer Road. Um, so I guess there is the potential that they would come to Nick at some point and say, Nick, give me a right of way through your road to access the land in this area. But it's probably a greater potential that they would use their existing access points off of Spurwink and off of Sawyer. Mm. But question yes um, but what would stop um, the Maxwell's from selling another lot to Nick and then Nick using that None. road harvest None. lane to None. access if his cousin yes. right. wanted to buy a, a lot from the Maxwell's. I think the, the biggest thing is there's no more if you pull it back up to the hammerhead there's no more availability to make more road furniture to get us third lot. That also means that there's no more dry land on this side of Trump Brook that is developable that I own. So are you, are you saying that this is too wet that, to extend the road or that you, would, that you would want to do it? I wouldn't say. You couldn't get a road that close to a house. My house is, if you go to the house picture, I guess that might help her. I just yes, yes. I, I guess I'm not as confident that there is a potential in the future. Well, we could limit any waiver to the exist the status quo on the layout, right? Oh yeah. Hypothetically, if a waiver were granted, it could be only to serve that one lot with one residence. And then, if there was another lot created, then that person would come before you and ask you to lift that waiver. And then, at that point, you could. So you know, you the same you. situation. As you are right now. Well. Yeah. Liza. I have a question for Maureen or Elaine. Do you remember at the time um, why the private road instead of the private access way? Yeah, because a private road serves a single house, and this was going to serve a single house. Oh, I, I've been flipped. I was thinking. I, actually, I'm, private, I have the private access private way. Private access way serves yeah. a single house, and so we approved it seemed that it was okay to use private access way standards because it was only ever going to serve a single house. But it's a private road. Because it abut, I mean, it, it abutted a huge amount of land owned by the Maxwell family. Yes, and, that's actually in the notes. And so that's why minutes. it was approved as a private road because it was anticipated that there was a chance it could be used for more access. Yes, it's from the notes and it does say that He's seeking a private road approval instead of a private access way in order to preserve the Maxwell's access to the remaining 78 acres. That's why it's not a private access way. That's why it is a road. So the Maxwell's can get back there. But the understanding that. was that there wouldn't be any future residential development served by that Correct. roadway. Right. This was going to be it because this was this a was farm. This was going to be it. From the notes, from the minutes. Um, I've heard from this side. I'm actually keeping a tally. I'd like to hear from <laughs> the three of you now. We need to give direction to the applicant. We found this complete, but we need some direction on what we're going to do about I'm, this. I'm having a very hard time making up my mind about this because on one hand I'm looking at this note from the fire chief that says Maureen my recommendation for the private road width for this project is that we follow the standard and I'm very reluctant to go against the fire chief. Um, on the other hand looking at the photo that you put up there I have a hard time really seeing that road getting wider and not just having a bad impact on the on the visual appearance of the neighborhood, so I'm torn. Fifty percent one way. Yeah. 
you're losing the I move the on then to uh, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Would you like to make a comment on your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going right down the line. Oh, no. You're next. I, I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of in Drove's camp. Um, that's a big honking road for that little, you know, expanded lane that you see in the photo. Uh, and and I, I know the fire chief will typically say, let's just let's stick with the full size. Um, I, I guess I'm leaning mildly toward not granting a waiver, but I must say, I, is, is there anything in between what he's asking for and what the fire chief wants that would be, could keep the scale of that thing down a little bit? <clears throat> I, I well, they have proposed to go to 18 feet, right? Yes. Opposing a. Right now it's. Oh, eight, 18 with two on either side grass, so then you have no. a, a 20 18. foot. Hmm? 18, no grass, just 18 feet of gravel. Right now it's 14 and yeah. two foot grass on gravel shoulders. So we'll go to 18 of gravel 18 instead of, gravel. of the 22. So the standard would be two more feet on each side. <clears throat> And Liza, he mulls that over. Well, one observation is I feel like this shows the benefit of our subdivision ordinance because when development falls under that, um, you can avoid situations like having a road right behind the Castro's house. Sorry, um, because somebody would never plan a subdivision or a road that way, where a road would go right, you know, right around somebody's house. And I feel like this is a really unfortunate situation. Um, because even if we don't grant the waiver, that road could still be built. And as long as um, uh, 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 a lot is um, calved off uh, more than every five years, this will never fall under the subdivision ordinance and it won't be good planning. And so it's an unfortunate. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling with the decision because I do feel like uh, the wider road would, you know, impact the abutters. But um, also, I feel like the fact that it's raised makes it um, the roads um, in practice be even narrower than it really is because oftentimes somebody can go off the roadway and um, it's okay in an emergency situation. But here, because it falls off so much, it effectively gives it less buffer on either side. And so therefore, to me, would uh, heighten the importance of having it wider now that I see the photo. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a crown. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a crown or, you know, there's a, a drop off. Is this centered? Is this right here centered within the? Um, yeah, within the existing 40 foot right away. 44. Okay, it is centered. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We are still looking for some direction for our applicant. What are the votes on the, on the other side? Carol Ann is fine with the uh, proposal. Wave. No wave. No wave. No and wave. I'm a no wave. And the, the other three in a row would like to see it at standard. One okay, three no. But don't let our side <laughs> No, but yeah. we need some direction. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to see it at standard. I mean, I know in workshop I said, um, gosh, we're getting um, four more feet out of this. We're going from 14 to 18, and that's better than 14. But what I didn't realize is, until tonight, in looking at the photo, was that, in effect, we're not getting more roadway, which is graveling over the existing shoulders, but, but we're not getting any more plateau, anything wider. And, and so I feel like seeing this photo, which was very helpful, and I think it's better that we didn't wait for the sidewalk, the site walk, um, puts me in the direction of wanting the wider road way, okay. wider base. Okay, thank you. That sure. does make four. So at this time, you two do not need to make up your mind. But. Uh, I will probably vote for the standard. I would actually end up agreeing with Carol Ann. So. Okay. Um, at this time, then, it will be made to standards, but I did like your offer for Mr. Castro that 
you could possibly make the turnaround on the right hand side instead of the left to give them that two feet. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me anything about any of the buffering between uh, the Castro's property and uh, the new, where the road will be? Um. You can see, here's the aerial shot. It's all heavily wooded, so the intention is to retain as much buffer as possible. So the 24 feet, we're gonna create a 50 foot wide right away to the left. The 24 foot road will be centered in that right away. There'll be as much of the 22. tree buffer created as possible, but we still need to have a swale in there and I have a cross call. So that's, that's the intent. They have no, the only trees they want to take down, obviously, are for the gravel construction. If we can narrow that, that'll help the abutting neighbor. And then the driveway will be 20 feet, 12 feet wide, and they'll limit the, obviously, they don't have any intention to take down mm -hmm. any more trees than they have to. <clears throat> okay, that's good to hear. Um, now that we're at the standard, does anyone have any further questions or comments for the applicant? Was the decision just on the width of the road, or was that pertain to all the standards on curbing and pavement? Okay. Standards are standards. Is anyone looking now, though, to waive any of the standards? Let's talk about the first 50 feet. Um, I am inclined to pave those first 50 feet. We had another applicant before us tonight, and I remember at the workshop that applicant was saying, of course I'm going to pave that first 50 feet because I don't want to bring all the gravel from my road out onto the public road. And I'm like, ah, that's why they do it. That's why we have the standard. But having said that, would anyone else, it's up to the board if you'd like to waive that standard. Okay. First 50 would be waived. Sorry, I'm just looking for your waivers. Curbing. The curbing. Curbing. Curbing, yeah. Anyone like to waive the curbing? Curbing from Valley Road onto onto Harvest Lane. Right. Is that urban That's correct. It's just the radii. Just the. I'm not seeing that. Um, I, I, I don't have a big need for curbing, but paving of the emergency vehicle turnaround. So we that can, is now. We can resolve that differently. Okay. The paving of it? Yeah, you don't need to because it's not a turnaround because turnaround's on the other if, side. Yeah, I mean, hopefully if we can get that decided that I'd like to narrow the turnaround and not pave it, so. Okay, I think those are all the waivers. I think we covered them. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? Are we going to do a site walk? That'd be my next question. Would people like to take a site walk? Based on the questions that have been asked here tonight, I think yes. Okay, Carol Ann Wood, anyone else like to take a site walk? I would agree with that. Okay, why don't we take a site walk? Okay. All right, so we are already evening. Okay, we're meeting as a board on the 24th, so the evening. Okay, Maureen has mentioned the last week in April. That would be Monday the 28th, Tuesday 29th, or the 30th. I think Joe's back. When are you back? I'm back. Is anyone 28th or 30th? 28th? Either the 28th or 29th, preferably not the 30th. Okay. Anyone else? In the morning. I can't do Tuesday morning. 28th. Monday morning. I can do Monday morning. Liza, can you make Monday morning? I can do uh, like 730. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 I don't want to that move to Yeah, I, Monday I, I could do it but early. Okay, 730 on Monday. Sorry, Henry. This, I'm All right. But I, we need to check with the, with the applicant. You, is that all right? Monday, April 28th, Todd, 7.30 in the morning. Site walk. 7.30? <laughs> sure. <laughs> what day did you have? It's Monday morning. It's Monday. Okay. It's good for me. All right, then we will have that. 
okay. site walk. That will be April 28th, which is a Monday, 7.30 a.m. Meet on Harvest Lane. Yes. Okay. Yes, I will. I will. Everyone else set with that? Okay. Then we'll hold a uh, public hearing next month. All right, oh, then I need. Motion? Yes, I would appreciate a motion. I'll happily okay. give you a motion here. I'll do that. Give me the mic. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Nick Tamaro for an amendment to the previously approved Harvest Lane private road to extend the road to provide adequate frontage for a second lot to be lot be tabled to the regular May 22nd, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Joe. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Okay, the motion is passed. Thanks. All right, but we will see you next on the 28th. Item, the BA District 100 seat zoning amendment. Maureen, do you have anything for us? Yes, so before you tonight is an amendment to the zoning ordinance, specifically the Business Aid District. Right now, if you own a restaurant in the Business Aid District, you are limited to a maximum of 80 seats. There's been a request from the Good Table to change the ordinance and increase it from 80 seats to 100 seats, which would allow them to um, come back to the board or site plan amendment to increase their approved number of seats from 75 to 100. So this would be an amendment to 1965, section D, where we would take the number 80 and change it to a number 100. And what the board is asked to do this evening is to uh, review the amendment. If you're, if you're okay with the amendment, to table it to next month's meeting when a public hearing can be held. And then following the public hearing, you can make a decision on whether or not you want to recommend it to the town council. Thank you. Okay. Um, we can open this item up for public comment. Does anyone wish to comment on this item? Okay. We're going to close that. And then I would ask the board, um, do you have any discussion? Yes, I do. Um, so last week I did a bit of research, most fun research I've done. I went to the good table for dinner. <laughs> and um, I counted seats discreetly. And I counted 104. And then I emailed the code enforcement officer and I asked him to send me the notice of violation because um, part of our zoning ordinance is when there's a violation, that a notice of violation gets written up. The violation and the time that the person has, what's needed to cure the violation and the time this person has to cure it. And um, if it's not cured in time, then some fines set in and those are set by state statute. And we spend a lot of time on this board to make sure that the applications fit the ordinance. And, and I, I've spent many, 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 many hours reviewing and discussing applications, as have you. And there's a certain integrity to the process. So um, the code enforcement officer went into the good table and observed this violation in July of last year. He did not write it up. And uh, a discussion was had with the good table, apparently about how they might cure this violation. No notice was written up. And they've gone to the um, council and asked for a change in the ordinance. 
and um, I do not think this is the right way to run a town. And I don't. I would hope that none of you think that this is the right way to run a town. And I just find it upsetting that we're even considering making this change when a notice of violation was not written up, and the and the ordinance is being flouted. I have a question for more you again. Is the hundred is the eighty seat eighty seats? maximum that can be in there, or is it 80 people that can be sat down at any given time maximum? I'm not too sure which, which, which when you say a seat, that somebody sitting at a seat being served, or is it somebody sitting, or is it a, an empty seat? There were 104 chairs, and it was very crowded, and people were being seated in all, in all three rooms. I don't think that there, there were not 104 people there, but I am sure as the day is long, that if 104 people came in, they would have sat all 104. Well, that's, that's another question. I, it's, it's supposed to be the seats, whether or not there's a body okay. in, in the right. seat. Um, just to kind of follow up, I, I do know that uh, when the code officer um, finds a violation, his first step is to um, meet with whoever is in violation and there's a discussion and most of those are cured by whoever's doing something they're not supposed to be doing immediately stopping doing what they're doing. So um, he doesn't always write up a violation because someone may be doing something you say you weren't supposed to do that they say oh sorry won't do it again. Um, obviously this situation appears to be a bit different. And I have to say, this feels like spot zoning, changing a zoning ordinance to, to benefit one interested party. And I feel that the town would be vulnerable in lawsuit. Further, I looked at the comprehensive plan, which describes the BA district as a small seaside community. And, 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 and um, one of the uh, recommended changes in the comprehensive plan was to rewrite the BA district zones, which was done. And at that point, 80 seats was the number of seats that was chosen to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. And I see no reason to rewrite it. And I also feel like we've talked about tonight about a le level playing field. Rudy spent a lot of money um, on developing their site plan. And they were under a lot of scrutiny by us and the abutters. To, uh, to be consistent with the code. And I don't think it's fair, and I don't think it says uh, good things about Cape Elizabeth um, to let a neighbor in the same district go on for almost a year now, violating a very, very important part of the code. And I don't, e I think for, we can't even, I don't even think for the sake of appearances, it would be proper to consider this. Anyone have any follow-up comments to that? Yes, Peter. <clears throat> yeah, just a, a little bit on the other side of the coin. Uh, no doubt they have been seating more than 80 people. And I don't think that's ever been a secret. And I, I had the impression that it's a seasonal problem. It's a summer extra business comes to the restaurant in the summer. We t even talked a little bit about having a uh, an increased seating in the summer just simply to be business friendly and when restaurants are trying to earn their living and then they can they can show that they have adequate parking and, and everything else it, it, it seemed like a reasonable thing I, I had the impression that the code enforcement officer said to the applicants you know if the ordinance isn't changed we're going to have to hold you to 80 that's just the way it goes so let's see if you can get the ordinance changed, and that's that's why we're here. I don't think it's any great sinister conspiracy. It's just that they were getting more business than that 80 seat count could accommodate. So I, I don't think they're bad people or that they're, you know, hor horrible law flouters. They oh, just, I, it, it, I, it has I, been I, going on, sure. That. So <clears throat> If I could get away with um, having a business in my house where I made a lot of money and nobody called me on it, I would do it. <laughs> that wouldn't, and I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying what kind of town do we want to live in? 
And um, there's a difference between being business friendly and doing business transparently, fairly, and by the book. But you, your penalty for the good table is to, under no circumstances, consider raising the seating limit in the A BA district for anybody. I, I'm not, I don't quite get that. I don't think that <clears throat> changing the ordinance is the right way for, for one interested party who brings it to the town council is the right way to deal with a, a, a serious violation of the code. Um, Liza, I got a question for you at this point. When we were in our workshop, we were discussing um, the district as it is on Shore Road and as it is out uh, by the uh, good Route table. 77. Route 77. And we came down to having to take a head count because um, there were some people that said um, it should be 100 seats in one, which would be Route 77, 80 over in Shore Road. You were one of the deciding because I asked you a follow-up, and you're like, no, I want to stick with 100 in both. So given where you were the tipping point on that, I am wondering, are you asking this to go back to workshop, or do we have enough people that just want to continue this discussion and go forward? I, I guess the reason I wanted the BA to be consistent in both areas is because I wanted to stay away from the perception of spot zoning. I think that's mm -hmm. very, very important, and I think it's a vulnerability here, frankly. Um, and uh, what sealed the deal for me was going and counting the seats and then learning that no notice of violation was written. Okay. Victoria? Yes. Carol Ann. I understand Liza's... Um, I want, I want, I I, anger is the only word I can come up with, but I, I don't think it really goes that far. Frustration? Frustration. Anger. Thank anger. you. Um, my understanding when this came before us was the code enforcement officer was aware of the violation, um, and the conversation, I don't know, I don't know exactly which route it went, but it was, I'm not going to write you up on this if we, you know, once this process starts. It's like somebody being in violation and while you're working through the court system, you allow it to stand the way it's being run until it, the case finishes. So it's somewhat, that was my understanding is somewhat what we were doing, that nobody was unaware that they were, they had 100 seats in their restaurant um, and that they were working under that. So I understand, I do truly understand her frustration with uh, not only finding out you know, that, that it's not just 100, it's 104, <laughs> you know. But I, I don't believe we were ever under any illusion that he, I, I never was under any illusion that he wrote anything up on them, that it was all verbal. Mm -hmm. Then at this point, I would have to say, yeah, okay, go ahead, Elaine, before. I guess, um, I think this situation is a little bit different than a lot of, violations. This is a very easy violation to cure. The only reason not to cure it is to preserve the economic potential of those extra 20 and now 24 seats. So I have a lot of sympathy with the position that Liza is taking that, you know, it's quite clear what the current requirement is. It's 80 seats. And any other restaurant in the BA district is held to 80 seats, and they are quite clearly in violation of that requirement, and all that would need to happen is a reconfiguration of the seating or closing the porch or whatever while this process is pending. And as we all know, amending an ordinance can be a very long process. Occasionally it's quick, it usually isn't, and so for a very long time, one business in our town is getting an economic advantage from knowingly not complying with the ordinance because I assume for economic reasons. And I think that's not appropriate. Um, in some ways, that's not our job. Enforcement is not our job. Our job is, is approvals. On the other hand, one way we could make a statement about enforcement would be to simply table this for another month not set it for public hearing, um, and perhaps that might send a message that 
we would, because this has been presented to us all along, is we are doing this because the good table has asked us to do it. And that's essentially what, that's the message I understood from the town council, and to some extent they don't come to us with clean hands, and I'd be much more inclined to move it through, to spend the time that it's going to take us to listen to a public hearing, and I assume we'll have people coming to the public hearing. Um, and, and many people may be in support of it, but there's only one moving party that I'm aware of now, and I would rather give them the opportunity to come into compliance and come to us and in a little bit better position. So I guess my, the end of that is, is I, would, I would be in favor of tabling this for another month um, and addressing the compliance issue. I would agree with that. Can I? Yes. It's, you could also look at it, though, that our job really is to weigh in on the appropriateness of whether 80 seats is the right number for the BA district or 100. I mean, had they been complying all along, we still might conclude after discussion that 80 seats was the correct number and not 100. Um, so I don't know if whether or not they are complying with the ordinance at the moment really has bearing on our decision to go forward with this change in the ordinance. And we're just advising the ordinance committee. I mean, we're not making a decision. Yeah, I feel even more strongly than Joe on this. I, I think we're expanding our, our focus well beyond what it should be. And with all due respect to Liza's umbrage, we've been working on this thing for quite a while. This is not new news. Uh, we knew the minute we got it that they had been seating more than 80 for some time and they are trying to figure out how to solve it. And I, I just think for us to start shaking our fingers at the good table and saying, you're bad folks, we're going to punish you somehow, you know, that's, that's ben jo Ben's job. Uh, all we've been asked to do is say, what is a good number for seating in the BA district in light of the current facts? And the current facts are this one restaurant is you know, fields that can, uh, you know, wants to be able to seat 100 people. At one point, we talked about some towns do not have a seating requirement. They simply require the parking to be adequate and let the seating be what it wants to be. We chose not to go that way, and in our last workshop, we said that preserving the small restaurant, the small town, small restaurant theme indicated at least to the, a number of us that yeah, there should be a cap on, on seats. But 80, 100, I mean, we're, we're, we're not top, talking orders of magnitude here. And I just think for us to get all, at this point, all exercised about these, these bad violators down at the good table, I, I, I just, this, that, that's, not, that's not our job. That's not what we're supposed to do. Yes, Liza. Yeah, I, I think I recall, Peter, that their site plan is for 75 seats. Um, and. Uh, I have a hard time volunteering and coming back again and again and um, putting in time if the ordinance isn't being enforced. I, I, I'd like to see that as someone who's, who cares about good governance and in a level playing field. And I agree with Elaine that this is our opportunity to make a statement. And it, yes, Elaine. I think we're inviting Rudy's to set up an extra 20 tables. <laughs> and my guess is they could probably do it out on their patio. They got plenty of room there to set up an extra 20 <laughs> tables. And we would have a hard time as a planning board complaining about that. And you look at the summer oven, we've just told those people that we strictly want to see on their site plan that they're complying with the BA ordinance and they're going to go to a lot of expense to do that in order to enforce and to respect our ordinances, why would they do that if we're saying, well, we'll tell you to do something, but if you don't do it, we're going to go ahead with our business and we're really not going to say anything. And we're not the enforcement arm, but I think it is appropriate for us to be mindful of the integrity of, of what we do, particularly because Rudy's is putting up a restaurant, C's 
has a restaurant right near the high school. It's a different zone, but it's the same message, so maybe they want to put a few extra tables out during the summertime. I think we're sending the wrong message to just sort of let it go and say, well, you know, for another six months, we're going to give you the summer season flouting our ordinance. I'd be inclined not to do that. But that's also a pretty good argument for saying, no, 80 is the number that we have, and it, that's what we should stay at. So at this point, Henry, one more, because I'm wondering, should we bring this back to workshop and have this discussion? Right. But Henry. Clearly, clearly, 80 is too small, although I'm not in agreement with what I'm saying. 80 is too small because if they can fill 100 or 104, then obviously there's a requirement or a necessity or a desire in the town to have that size restaurant. Um, and I'm normally in favor of free enterprise. But I think when you get, when you get something that says, why bother with the code? We don't have to be enforced. We can do what the world we like. I think I agree with that we're sending the wrong message. And I think the best way to do it is if we slow the process down, then maybe everybody will get the message. Um, I'm more inclined to look at this that we are not in agreement and we have things to iron out. I'm not necessarily trying to um, slow the process down. I well, want to make sure that we are doing the right thing. Okay. And I feel I am hearing that we're not now ready to present what we, were, we have in front of us. Is this a clear, concise um, consensus? Okay, then we should bring it back to workshop only because we are not in agreement and it does sound like people want to look at this again. Then would anyone like to make a motion? Well, before you do that, may I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. What are we going to gain by workshop? I'm not, yes, go ahead. Just to alert you, I will not be at the next workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I know the town manager will town be attending. manager will be. <laughs> but, but, but I say again, what, what would we gain from a workshop that we haven't already discussed this evening? Well, we, we need to come to a consensus on whether we're going to put this forward or not, and I don't know if we, I mean, just as it's written right now, we're just meant to go forward to public hearing. Uh, are we ready to do that? Right. I had I wrote you know, a couple of questions about how we're going to proceed tonight. I want to make sure. And if we're not sure. in agreement, how right. can we go forward to? I mean, if we're not closer together, how can we go forward to public hearing? I, I unless know. somebody would like to make a motion for a hundred seat and go forward. Does anyone want to take that motion, and then we can discuss the motion? Or, or I, can I make a motion? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that. Uh, the ordinance remains as it is at 80. Do I hear a second? Um, yes. Just one thing. You, you have been asked by the council to provide advice on a change, and I believe even if you don't want to change it, you still need to hold a public hearing on that. So would the motion, though, be... The, would the, the motion wouldn't really read as I said it would be no, you, told you, a public meeting and keep the 80 as, as current. The recommendation. The recommendation for 80 stay. Right. You, you, could, you, could, you could say I'd, I'd like to suggest that we take the draft amendment and we delete the change in the number and then we table it and still hold a public hearing May 22nd. You know, we don't go back to the town council until after we've had a public hearing. Right? Correct. That's what I'm saying. Yes. That could and, change and, whatever we thought today was right. Well, and yes. even though you're not proposing, even, even if you go with Joe's option, which is we're not going to make a change, I, I'm thinking you still need to hold a public hearing on that proposal to not change it before you make your formal recommendation to the council. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, do we have the memo from the council by chance? It's very brief. The whole thing is really very brief. But yes, what I have in front of me is a memo from the town manager dated August 14, 2013. Dear Maureen, 
Town Council on Monday, August 12, 2013, referred to the Planning Board a request to amend the zoning ordinance to allow restaurants in the BA zone to have 100 seats. Attached is a letter from the owners of the Good Table requesting the review. Thank you very much. And then the letter is um, a letter from the Kostopoulises, to whom it may concern, and this was sent to the Council. The Good Table Restaurant requests a meeting with the Planning Board. We would like to expand our seating capacity from 75 to 100 seats. We have the parking on site already to support this move, since oftentimes between quests and seats and quests waiting, I guess it's guests. Um, on the porch for a table, we have 100 people here already. We don't feel this will impact the town and its desire to remain quaint. We thank you very much for your help with this request. Um, and then we have a memo from the code officer, which was basically kind of the fill in the blank between the Kostopoulos and the council. Dear Michael, Lisa and Anthony Kostopoulos have requested a meeting with the planning board for the purpose of increasing their allowed seating from 75 to 100. The restaurant is currently in the business A district. Section 19-6-5D1 G states that restaurants shall be limited to no more than 80 seats. For this reason, a zoning change is required before the planning board can approve this increase in seating. So that's what you had for documentation what from- the dates for the board? The date of the letter from the Kostopoulos letter is undated, um, but I believe it probably came in late July because then the request that went to the council was for the August 12th council meeting and the date on the letter from the town code enforcement officer is also undated, but I believe it also was prepared at uh, the end of July for the August 12th, 2013 council meeting. So nine months ago, this thing has been, this, this thing has been out there for a while. We do have a motion on the table. I'll second the motion. Discussion on the motion? Could you repeat oh, the motion? Should we read it? Yeah, right. okay. crafted it a little bit. All right, let me, let me, um state this. So, motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that, based on the proposed text and the information presented, the BA 100 seat zoning amendment seating changes be removed and restored to 80 seats and be tabled to the regular May 22, 2014 planning board meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. Why, why did we, sorry, why did we remove the 100? Was it, was it passed last time? I mean, you made a reference to removing the 100. I may not have worded it well. well I okay. said, yeah. At the last workshop, I... No, no way, it was a workshop. We decided it wasn't we a motion. would go in favor of 100 seating, and I don't... But it wasn't a motion. It was but just... It, it sounds like what is suggesting is that the proposed amendment before you be changed. Oh, all right. Back okay. to 80, which okay. would make it not an amendment. Okay. And that you would still hold a public hearing. I just don't see what's happened between that last workshop and tonight that we didn't know already that's caused a 180 degree turnaround. I mean, yeah, I, I can tell you, I thought that they had 80 seats. I thought that they had cured the violation in the meantime. Well, no, I never thought that was. But you said you went there and did some research yesterday and had a meal, or yesterday or whatever it was. Thursday night. Thursday, I'm sorry. Uh, the only comment I would make to this is that um, we were looking at the two, Route 77, Shore Road, and at that time we did take a vote, and I was on the side of three against four, in which said, I believe that Shore Road should remain at 80. So this discussion is just a reflection on how I was feeling about um, not increasing the seating in the Shore Road area. And, oh, no, no, and we don't wish to spot zone, so I am willing to reconsider and, and, and listen to what the public has to say because my feelings were always a little split on this anyways. So that's, I can try to justify my 180 degree turn, is it's coming from the workshop. So we have the motion, we have a second, we'll take a vote at this time. All in favor of the motion. All those that oppose? Okay. So we will be holding a public hearing on May 22nd in regards to this. I would like to clarify something. You made the motion, right, Joe? Joe? Yeah. And you just read, read it. the text, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. The text and 
Elaine seconded. Yes, I believe. Or unless Liza already had seconded it. But I'm happy to say that. Liza seconded it. It was, I mean, excuse me, it was Elaine who, Elaine. I just need to clarify the record. Who wants to own it? I'll own it. It was Elaine. It was Elaine. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, last item on our agenda is adjournment. Oh, excuse me, it is actually public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Yes, sir. No public comment? Okay. Then the last item is adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion for adjournment? Yes, yes thank you. A second. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.